All right, we are stabilizing. Go ahead and start. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It's December 8th, 2023 at 9.02 a.m. I'm Jennifer Urban. I'm the chairperson of the board. Thank you very much for joining us today and happy Hanukkah to everybody who's celebrating. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, I have some logistical announcements. Today's meeting, of course, is on Zoom, um, so some of them relate to that. First, I would like to ask everyone to please be sure that your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. And for everyone, please note that the meeting is being recorded. Today's meeting will be run by the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. Um, at, after each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item, so please keep that in mind. If you wish to speak on an item and you're using the Zoom webinar, please use the raise your hand function. You can check the bottom of your screen um, and find that in the reaction feature down there. If you wish to speak on an item and you have called in by phone, Please press star nine, star nine on your phone to show the moderator that you are raising your hand. Our moderator will call your name when it is your turn and request that you unmute yourself for comment at that time. Those using the webinar can use the unmute feature and those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It's helpful if you identify yourself, but this is voluntary and if you're in the webinar, you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. The board welcomes public comment on each item on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please let us know by using the raise your hand functions and the moderator will recognize you. Um, relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of rules of the road under Bagley Keen. Both board members and members of the public may discuss agendized items only. And when speaking on an agenda item, both board members and members of the public must contain their comments to that agenda item. There are two additional options under Bagley Keene. First, the public can bring up additional topics when we get to the agenda item for that purpose. That is number eight today. However, board members can't respond. We can only listen. Second, items not on the agenda can be discussed by either, it can be suggested, excuse me, by either board members or members of the public for discussion at future meetings. That agenda item, uh, there's also an agenda item designated for that purpose, and it is number nine today. We will take breaks as needed. This will include time for lunch and shorter breaks as needed. Please note that we have a closed session item on the agenda today. Um, for when we get to that item, the board will leave the Zoom meeting we are all in now to discuss it and will return after it has completed its closed session discussion. During the time the board is in closed session, this Zoom session will remain open and members of the public can come and go as you like. My many thanks to the board members for their service and everyone who's working to make this meeting possible. I'd like to thank the team supporting us today. Mr. Philip Laird is meeting counsel. Mr. Ash Consultani is here in his capacity as our executive director, and multiple members of our legal division and policy and ledge divisions will be briefing us today. I would also like to thank and welcome our moderator, Ms. Elizabeth Allen, and ask Ms. Allen to now please conduct the roll call. Board Member De La Torre? Present. De La Torre present. Board Member Lay? Present. Uh, Lay present. Board Member McTaggart? Here. McTaggart here. Board Member Worth? Present. Worth present. Chair Urban? Present. Urban present. Madam Chair, you have five present members and no absences. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. The board has established a quorum. I would like to let everyone know that we will take a roll call vote on any action items. Um, we often have uh, comp complex and lengthy agendas. Um, today's is particularly complicated and lengthy. Um, so I will be working to help everyone move along um, and to facilitate conversation as we go. Um, and with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion and we will move to agenda item number two. 
This is an update from the new uh, California Privacy Rights Act Rules Subcommittee and a staff presentation of draft regulations on automated decision-making technology, risk assessments, and cybersecurity audits. We have a range of materials for this agenda item. I'd ask you to please turn your attention to those now. And Council Phil Laird will introduce the discussion. Please go ahead, Mr. Laird. Thank you, Chair Urban. There's a lot of ground to cover here on agenda item two, as you see. So I will map out how we plan to approach the topic, uh, each topic for today. So to use our time most efficiently, we do recommend starting with the cybersecurity audit regulations, uh, then moving on to risk assessments, and then finally to automated decision-making technology regulations. Um, so to orient everyone before we get started, for cybersecurity audits, there are a number of materials provided uh, that Ms. Anderson will be explaining momentarily. Um, however, staff will focus on the document titled Agenda Item 2A, Proposed Rulemaking Draft, Cybersecurity Audit Regulations, Clean Copy, which we propose should advance to formal rulemaking. Um, secondly, then there will be for risk assessments, the new rules subcommittee will be walking the board through the subcommittee's revised draft. And then finally, for automated decision-making technology, staff will be presenting an overview of the proposed framework for the board and suggest a number of topics for board discussion. As the board begins to consider these various proposals, though, um, I would like to recommend up front uh, as well as for, um, that these proposals, as well as the ones that we will be discussing in agenda items three and four, uh, ultimately proceed uh, to formal rulemaking as in a single rulemaking package. This is going to have the benefit of streamlining procedural requirements under the APA uh, and will ensure a consistent approach to inter interrelated elements. Uh, we can, of course, discuss that further once we've engaged in the discussion, but I wanted to preview that now uh, as we think about the best ways to advance these proposals going forward. Um, uh, for now, though, I'm going to pass the floor to um, Kristen Anderson, who's one of our senior attorneys in the legal division. Um, before we go into that, I think we have a question for the chair. Um, there's three pieces to this presentation, as uh, Mr. Lear explained. They are in different stages. Um, the first one, the cybersecurity proposal, um, the subcommittee had a draft that came to the board. We intake um, the comments from the board, and then the subcommittee moved it to the agency. It's now with the agency. So any edits that might come after this meeting will be um, done by the agency. The second piece is the uh, piece about risk assessments. That is a subcommittee draft. That's still with the subcommittee. Um, we, in, um, we edited it to um, address the feedback that we received from the board in the last meeting. Um, the third piece is actually a staff draft. It's not a subcommittee draft yet. We advanced it as a staff draft just to expedite the process as we're um, all um, looking forward to um, having a final version, as Mr. Blair mentioned, that can move to formal rulemaking. So the question that I have for the chair is, in terms of um, comments from the audience, should we take comments from the audience after each piece, or is it more appropriate to leave the comments from the audience to the end? How, we should, how should we proceed on that? I think we should proceed however is going to be most efficient for the public and for us. Um, given that I'm not on the subcommittee, I don't have a good sense of the relative um, length of each discussion. So um, if it's all right with everybody else, I think I'll play it by ear. And if we start with the cybersecurity regulations, um, we will have board discussion. And if it seems like the right time to ask for public comment, I will do that. If it seems like maybe we could hold for the next one or until the end, I will do that. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Phil mentioned, the first topic that we'll be addressing within agenda item two is the cybersecurity audit regulations. The associated meeting materials are the four at the top of today's meeting materials list prefaced by agenda item 2A. As Phil had mentioned, during the September 8th board meeting, the board agreed to move the draft cybersecurity audit regulations out of the subcommittee to enable individual board members to provide feedback directly to staff. The new rule subcommittee posted their final October 2023 revisions to the cybersecurity audit regulations as a meeting material for today's meeting as well, relative to the version that the board discussed in September. 
staff then received feedback directly from other board members individually and produced the proposed rulemaking draft, which considers all feedback, but ultimately stands as staff's final recommendation. Staff has provided a high level summary of all of those revisions made relative to the subcommittee's draft in the description of revisions chart, which is also one of the meeting materials. We're happy to answer any questions about the most recent draft of these regulations, but otherwise I will pass back to Phil for next steps. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so yes, in terms of um, this particular set of regulations, staff does recommend that the board uh, approve the proposed rulemaking draft of cybersecurity audit regulations and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to prepare the materials to initiate the formal rulemaking process. Um, we do also request discretion to make additional um, changes as necessary to ensure clarity and compliance with other APA requirements as we sort of prepare the final rulemaking package. Um, but at this point, um, we are happy to take questions about the proposal, but um, uh, um, are, are, are ready to move forward when the board thinks it's appropriate. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird and, and Ms. Anderson. I just have a couple of um, clarifying process questions so that I understand um, what the board um, is considering in terms of process. So um, my understanding from what you said would be that um, I would ask for a motion that would um, direct or and give staff authority to prepare this package for um, formal rulemaking, uh, which I understand would involve um, the getting the economic assessment that I understand is being worked on that we talked about in September, but the but the economists would need these would need us to do this so that they can judge the the material um, that they are assessing and, and 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 so there would be some work left to do this, and then it would come back to us with some more information, for example, from the economists um, to consider before we send it out for rulemaking. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, those familiar with the APA know that there's actually a lot of document preparation that has to uh, happen in advance of any any um, formal public comment period. So uh, we'd be preparing that, including the economic assessment, um, uh, to, and then bringing it back to the board one more time for review and approval before beginning that public comment um, thank you, portion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I ask because um, we had a fairly extended discussion in September about some of the thresholds. Um, and I think that the board generally um, would value, and I'm sure staff would value, having information from the economists. Um, and it seems to me like this is the way to be able to get that information from the economists that is in a um, uh, that is directed towards um, language um, that we would expect. And then, of course, we would get public um, feedback. So this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Ms. De La Torre, you came off mute. Would you like to ask a question or comment? I know. I believe uh, Member Lee is going to guide us to a conversation on the thresholds. That's the piece that we were hoping to um, be part of the discussion today. And even though we don't have full information on um, the cost, and that will come later, uh, I believe we asked for a reference in terms of the numbers, um, the number of businesses that will be captured. And we have some information there that we should share with the board and make part of that um, conversation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lay, please go ahead. Yeah, not, not much to add. I would, yeah, I was just going to ask, you know, we, we had, yeah, the discussion about the thresholds. Um, you know, we had three different tiers. Uh, you know, just any information uh, from staff would be helpful on, you know, while well, we, we, the 250,000 is the number and perhaps maybe the direction is, yeah, to release it for uh, formal rulemaking, but... <clears throat> maybe have some direction to, for staff to, you know, change those thresholds if, if that, depending on the economic analysis. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, thank you for the question and, and for the thoughts. Um, I, so I can share, we have been working with our economist teams to kind of do the uh, some preliminary work that we've, that, um, along these questions. And we know there was interest in understanding sort of number of businesses impacted depending on these thresholds. Um, our economist team really is at a very preliminary stage still of kind of developing their methodologies and data sets to make these evaluations. Um, and at this point, um, what we can share is that the team's preliminary estimates of the number of businesses um, 
can focus on two, one of two categories, but not merged. And that is um, they are able to look at the annual gross revenue thresholds, as well as then the number of businesses that meet the different personal information processing thresholds. Um, but we haven't found a way at this point um, to sort of merge those data sets into sort of a reliable number. So again, our economists are working towards that. Um, so in other words, we have separate estimates for the number of firms that meet gross annual revenue versus the PI processing thresholds. Um, and again, we'll be exploring ways in the uh, formal uh, development of the economic assessment to, to better merge those numbers to get a more accurate count. Um, but what I can share at this stage is that adding those estimates together provides, we, we can provide basically an upper bound that we anticipate um, is an overcount. Um, but again, we're at a very preliminary stage. So please don't hold me to so, some of these initial kind of thoughts that I'm sharing. Um, and so our, econ our economics team is conducting additional research to try to better refine these, these estimates. But the upper bound of businesses that we find are meeting the revenue threshold, uh, that 25 million or above threshold. Um, again, we're looking in a range of somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 businesses, um, but that's just the, the, the monetary threshold. Um, so keeping uh, that constant, but doubling each of the, um, PI processing thresholds, um, we, we see there's really no change in the amount of firms. So when we've been looking at the different PI processing thresholds, there hasn't really been uh, any, any, um, any significant reduction in the number of firms. Um, but if we grow the monetary threshold, so say instead of $25 million, if it's at $50 million, and we keep the PI processing thresholds at the same that we've proposed, then we do decrease the number of businesses potentially covered by the regulations um, to around the 10 to 20,000 range. Again, these are very preliminary numbers and I should be the first to say I'm not an economist, uh, more a messenger, um, but these are the types of, uh, these are the types of data sets and information we're looking at right now. And we are looking at ways to sort of better refine what it means to have a requirement of both that minimum monetary threshold as well as then the amount of PI processing uh, a given firm does um, that meets that, that monetary threshold. So um, I'm going to pause there. I will ask, of course, my colleague, Ms. Anderson, if there's something I missed at, misstated or left out, please do correct me. But um, uh, that's sort of the initial information. But to Mr. Lay's point, um, the plan is certainly to further refine these as we complete the required economic assessment for the, for the proposal. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Um, other comments or questions from the subcommittee? Um, I, I do have a question. So when we say, I think that the upper number that was mentioned, and I understand is preliminary, is um, 30,000 businesses um, that could be within the scope of this new requirement. Um, are we saying that there is you know, potentially 30, only 30,000 businesses in, I guess, internationally that make $25 million and are subject to CCPA, that that's like the top number of business that we think are subject to CCPA um, or the make based on that threshold on the 25 million. It just sounds a little low to me, to be honest. Um, so uh, good question. Um, uh... Basically, the analysis for sort of the economic impact is on California only. And um, uh, so my understanding is, um, I believe this is California businesses, although I think it could be expanded to um, nationally for those who are um, uh, doing business in California. But I would need to double check with our economists. Um, I would invite, of course, our executive director, Mr. Sultani, to jump in if he has anything more to add. Okay, let me repeat back to make sure I understand. So what we're saying is that the cost estimate that we will see will not consider costs that are costs on businesses that are not California businesses. That what we're saying that the Office of Administrative Law requirements or our AP requirements do not do not include that cost and therefore we're not calculating it. The uh, cost report. Oh, go ahead. I can jump in, Phil. So so um in, indeed we're we're following what the previous analysis was for the past SRIA, which included, my understanding was businesses located in 
California or doing business with headquarters in California. So having physical presence and, and doing business in California. And that's what's required under the administ OAL requirements. We have looked at and tried to compare national data, but we've not yet incorporated that into our models just because the requirement in the state is to look at the impact of our regulations to California. And that's how the economists have done in the past. And that's the model we're considering, but um, uh, we're, we're flexible. Um, thank you. Mr. Worth. Yeah, I just want to clarify, you said headquartered in the state. Is it just anybody that has business has an operation in California that meets the revenue threshold, regardless of whether quote unquote headquarters are? They don't have to be headquartered in California specifically, do they? So I think the, the what they looked at was businesses headquartered in California or with physical uh, businesses in California. So that's what in the last three, uh, uh, the 20, this is the 2020, um, uh, oh, sorry, 2019 regulatory impact assessment that was done for DOJ uh, prior to our existence. And that's how they modeled, you know, that's how they calculated those numbers, if I remember correctly. Uh, okay. Can I just jump in for, for, for Mr. Worth? Um, question, the law covers anybody doing business in California. I guess the, the APPA uh, requirement is just to uh, evaluate the businesses that are located in California, but the scope of the law is obviously on anybody doing business in California. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Right, that um, that's actually really helpful. I appreciate the information. That makes sense. Um, the numbers seem a little low to me at the beginning because I was thinking, you know, everybody that's subject. But if it's just California, it makes sense that it would be lower. So the other piece of the equation here, in addition to know the number, let's say it's thirty thousand, and I know that's preliminary, will be to understand the cost of the requirement, the cost of the audit, and I, I you know, that will be very difficult to. Um, ascertain because it's a new requirement. But I did um, try to get a better understanding of what other comparable audits cost. And I would like to share this with the board. Um, so in terms of you know something that will be comparable like a SOC type audit, my understanding is that the lower threshold of cost will be, um, you know, it depends on which which type there's SOC one, SOC two, SOC three. But it will likely be um, at the minimum between ten thousand and fifty thousand dollars. If it's a large business, we're talking about costs that can be one hundred thousand dollars to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And obviously, there's you know there's a lot of calculations that need to be done. Um, we do have a provision that will enable organizations that have gone through cybersecurity all this for other purposes to kind of use that for compliance with our rule. But um, I think that that gives us a, a, at least a general idea of what is the cost of the of the requirement that we can bring into the threshold. My inclination in terms of advice to the staff to have a more clear cut understanding of the cost um, when we uh, have the final thresholds uh, will be to think about um, setting the, the threshold into around two things. Number one, what we have done at the subcommittee level is the revenue. Right now we have 25 million. It might be that the staff recommend something higher in the next version. And the, the number two thing that um, I think should be used or we should consider using is number of employees. I actually went through several proposals that are, um, uh, you know, that have been enacted into law. And the one thing that I saw in terms of defining what's a small business that was constant in them is to identify what the number of employees is. Uh, uh, looking at government code 4467, this is for disability assessments and education, government code 121962, that's California Small Business and non for profits for COVID paid sick leaves. There's an, an, a number of other laws that try to carve out small businesses, and they typically do it on, on the basis of the number of employees. I think that would be a clear cut threshold that if we see the legislative is using for this purpose, we should consider using for the purposes of um, setting our carve out with the idea of, at least at the beginning, excluding small and even medium businesses from this requirement um, so that we can be mindful of the cost that we are imposing. Um, so I, want like, I would like to kind of 
gather feedback from the board in terms of that idea of setting the thresholds on revenue and employees. Thank you, Ms. Um, I'll invite Mr. McTaggart and Mr. Worth to um, speak if they'd like, and I have some thoughts I could share. Um, I, like my feedback on, on, on the package right now? Oh, I think Ms. Delatore was asking about the, um, the thresholds and yeah. the uh, thought of, um, looking at the number of employees. Yeah. I, I'm not a huge fan of the number of employees. I think that's not necessarily one that kind of resonates with me. I think, I think kind of keeping the framework, whether it's, uh, revenues or, uh, processing is, is more conducive to, um, uh, kind of the, the the general framework of the of the law. I wouldn't want to introduce a kind of a new metric at this point. I don't think. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Worth, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just no, no, please. Just I mean, if you like that's it. fine. I think um, if you think about, it, I guess my thought is, I think I, I agree with 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 probably the number of employees would not be necessary to add. And I guess really the reason why revenue is so important is because we want to think about what this cost could do to a business, right? So it's really about the processing of PI that to me, that is what should be the focus. But I do I, I do think we need to get this feedback back from the economists about, you know, better understanding of how many businesses will be covered. And I, and I think it's, it, it did seem low to me, but I think it's, we'll see what it is, whatever it is, it is. And then I'd like to really understand the audit cost because I don't know, um, and I, I assume is that something they're gonna they're gonna look at, right? Because this is a pretty unique type of audit. So I don't know how you somebody's gonna comp it out as was mentioned, it hasn't been done before. But we really understand what we're imposing. So I think the number of employee is not as important to me. I just I want to understand what we're asking businesses in California to take on. Um and I think that's what we need to really kind of wrap this up. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Um I, ap I appreciate the thought. Um, I, I tend to agree with Mr. McTaggart and, and Mr. Worth. We do have companies that are worth a lot, um, have very high revenues, and most importantly, from, in, from my perspective, handle a lot of personal information. Um, and proportionally, they may have quite few employees. I would also be loath to give businesses um, an incentive to have fewer employees, which who could you know, help maintain security and so forth. Um, so I think going on um, the revenue is a good um, step for now. Um, I would like to have uh, attention to the risk basically, which I said in September, which ties to how many Californians information are you processing um, and, and so forth. Um, I agree with everyone that we do need to understand um, what sort of proportionally we're, we would be imposing on businesses. Um, in my view, the way for us to get that information is, is twofold. Um, one is to um, have the economists prepare the economic analysis um, to go together with the uh, initial statement of reasons and so forth. Um, so that we could discuss again um, for our decision about what to put to rulemaking. And then most importantly, hearing from Californians and California businesses in the rulemaking about the practical effects on them. Um, you know, the economists will give us good information, um, but we also need, in my view, information directly from businesses. And the way to get that um, is to have comment from businesses in the rulemaking. I think we should make good choices to start. And I think this is a good start. I, I think I said this in September. I couldn't tell you which of these thresholds is the right one exactly. Um, I really appreciate all the thought and work the subcommittee and staff put in to giving us some um, thresholds to, to, to start with. And I think that we need the economists and then the public's input um, to know for sure. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. I, I'm assuming that the staff has enough feedback here, but um, maybe I saw Vince, um, sorry, a member Lee coming up. I don't know if he. It, it said a fire alarm was going off. Oh. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe Mr. Lee's got a fire alarm going off. In the oh, so, so do we? Sh shall we? Shall we pause? Uh, take a short break, or? Um, should we proceed? 
Well, he can't tell us. Um, so I, I can uh, uh, quickly, let me quickly call him since this is a subcommittee presentation, he might be comfortable with just me. I, I agree, I'd love to have him not be here for, for this topic. So, um, so everyone, let's take a, a five minute break um, and uh, we, will, we will reconvene when um, we have Mr. Layback. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Ms. Allen. I believe um, we can start again. Uh, I'll see if Mr. Lay has been able to come back. Hi, Mr. Lay. Hey there. Sorry about that. Well, <laughs> the fire alarm went off. <laughs> sorry, sorry, you had to. Sorry, you had to take the meeting outside. But hey, at least we're on Zoom, so we can do that. Um, if we'd been in Oakland, we'd all have to troop outside and just wait. Welcome back, everyone. Give members of the public a minute to turn their cameras back on and also make sure we have everyone with us from staff. Okay, so um, uh, where we, well, I'm not actually sure when the alarm went off, Mr. Lay, um, but we were talking about the thresholds. Um, and uh, where we were, I believe um, there was a general sense that we would like input from the economists. We'd like more information. Um, I expressed an opinion that I would like to get information directly from businesses and members of the public, which we would get through rulemaking. Um, I don't know if you were here for all of that <laughs> or if there's anything um, you wanted to, to add before we continue. No, I, I'm supportive of that. Uh, yeah to advance this as uh, quickly as we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, other comments on the cybersecurity audit requirements, and I will let, give you a preview that based on the work that the subcommittee has done um, over two years, which is incredibly impressive, and staff has done, um, and uh, the my understanding of where we are or could be in the process, uh, I would um, be, I, I plan to suggest a motion um, to go ahead and direct staff to take the package and put it together for formal rulemaking, um, authorizing them to make additional changes. They may, for example, get one-way input from the board um, to improve clarity or, or otherwise um, make it compliant with the Administrative Procedures Act to, of course, put together the package with the economist's information and so forth. It would, of course, come before us again um, for full discussion before we voted it um, to go to the 45-day um, uh, public comment to give the public time to um, uh, the opportunity to tell us what they think directly. Um, but that's sort of where I am on this item at this point. Um, I know that wasn't a formal motion uh, because I thought, well, I'll take the subcommittee's lead, but I thought they might want to go ahead and talk about risk assessments, but that's what I'm thinking. Ms. De La Troy? Right. I believe from the subcommittee perspective for the cybersecurity rules, that's already been done. Um, but if we need to vote on it um, or take comment before we vote for cybersecurity, that's, you can guide us through that. Okay. Well, what I suggest is why don't I just hold this? And I, I gave you the substance, but I, um, while we continue with risk assessments, I will put together um, uh, something that's a more of a formal motion, uh, and maybe we can 
um, ask for public comments on the cybersecurity rules and the risk assessments together um, so that they ha everybody has a good opportunity to comment and we can be as efficient as possible. Okay, so before we move to the um, rules on risk assessments, I just wanna make sure that other board members don't have any comment that they wanna make on cyber um, as we will be kind of moving along to the next um, package. Uh, my, my hand's up. I, I don't know if you see it uh, there, but... Uh... Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. McTaggart. I did not... You know why? Because it's on top of the yellow lock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so my my sincere apologies. Please go no, ahead. No, no problem. I'm like, am I, am I missing something here? <laughs> no. um, I just had a couple of... Uh, uh, a couple of comments in the cybersecurity audit, which I think is generally in really good shape. Um, uh, so just the one, you know, and today a, a number of my comments, I think for the regulations are gonna uh, be colored by the injunction on the uh, age appropriate design code. Some of the, some of my thinking from having watched, you know, read that extensively. And I guess under the scope of the cybersecurity audit, my sort of one comment in 7123A, um, you, you know, we're only, luckily it says uh, in sort of the fourth line, it says the cybersecurity audit may assess the following things. So we're not saying shall, so that's that's good. But, you know, when I, the last sentence about the negative impacts, including impairing their consumer's control over their personal information, as well as economic, physical, psychological, reputational harm, I think, especially in light of that that decision, having a business have to weigh in on what the psychological harm to a potential consumer is or is not, that just felt very much in the land of of compelled speech. Kind of like, okay, who knows what the what the psychological harm to one you know consumer A versus consumer B. So I would I would suggest striking that last sentence, um, the one starting with those negative impacts to consumers include impairing, um, and then on on that front. Um, uh, I have a couple of typo stuff which I can send separately but in in the next this is I guess we're down in it's the same section still 71 23 but it's Q which for me is on page I'm, I'm in the red line page 11 and it's we're, we're talking about you know what their uh, what the audit should include and I just think that what we're saying in number Q, how the business manages its response in Q, and then the next, the very next Q, little sub one, um, for the purposes of subsection Q, security incident means an occurrence that actually potentially jeopardizes and a little way later, later down, or that constitutes. I think if you read that, because it's kind of in the present tense, it, it would mean I'm a business and I have to come up with how I'm gonna manage every single cybersecurity incident out there, which I think is kind of a large task. And if we change that to how the business managed anything that happened and how the business you know, uh, evaluated something that je jeopardized uh, or that constituted, I just think asking businesses to sort of say, here's the universe of things that could happen. How are they supposed to know that? So I, I would try to limit to the, scope of that to what actually happened, how they managed cybersecurity instance, unless there's some particular reason why that's not the not the case. And actually in that same little sub one, I think there's a typo that's repeated later. It's it should be unauthorized activity resulting in the loss of availability of personal information. Um, but that's my 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 comments on the cybersecurity audits. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. And just as a reminder, um individual Changes like this um, absolutely can can go to staff um, for incorporation. This is not, you know, this doesn't mean that the words have to be exactly the words before uh, that the words we have now have to be the words before we before. Yeah, I just wasn't too sure about how people felt about. I mean, I some of that the wordsmithing stuff maybe, but the other the the one about the scope anyway. The management. It's the one about whether they have to start weighing in about what the psychological harm to a consumer is, the physical harm to a consumer, reputational harm to a consumer, that that feels. I think uh, I think it's helpful. It's helpful to hear your thoughts for sure. Um, and I'm sure staff will take them into account. Uh, I'm 
supportive of striking out that sentence. I think that um, Mr. Matagar made a good case. Um, if I if I may, I will certainly take that feedback back, and and we appreciate it. Um, the one point that I wanted to raise in response to Board Member McTaggart's feedback in Q sub one, um, the the concept is about how you generally manage cybersecurity incidents or security incidents as we're defining them here. So I, there is I, a sense. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, Ms. Anderson. We've we've Mr. Lay has um, is maybe hopefully being able to go back indoors. I'm I, I'm still outside. Oh, okay. All right, and you just needed to. Um, yeah, there, there was just some folks walking around. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, okay. I just All right. move across the street. Okay, feel free, Mr. Lay, to just jump in and t let us know if you need us to pause for a moment while you go back inside. We'll do. We'll do. My apologies, Ms. Anderson. Please go ahead. Not at all. Um, I was just going to say that the the concept of incident management um, is is one that is uh, it's common throughout businesses and just having. Um, a proactive sense of how you will manage incidents as they come up and how you will escalate them and contend with them. So that was the intention in having it be um, proactive. Um, I just wanted to say that, obviously, I, I heard your feedback um, and we appreciate it. And then, um, Phil, I didn't know if you wanted to address the the, the previous point just about assessing um, the AADCA decision, that that is something that we're, that we're conscious of and considering. Yeah, absolutely. I think staff can kind of, of course, continue reviewing with that in mind um, and we'll provide a recommendation sort of in the final draft that we propose. Um, uh, I suppose though, I, you know, I'm starting to see some consensus building around striking a specific provision and I, I think I would appreciate some direction from the board on whether or not that is the direction staff should take. Uh, I, you know, on, on the issue of psychological harm, I don't think the request is necessarily to, you know, I think if you're assessing that, you know, you're, you're holding information that could cause psychological harm, if lost, you know, that is something to assess in your, your protection for that data. So I don't necessarily think it's asking them to, you know, control for every single psychological harm, but just whether the risk of this data being leaked uh, could, could cause that. Mr. Worth? Yeah, I'm fine. I was fine with how Mr. Taggart explained it, and I was fine with removing it. I also, um, I, I I certainly appreciate uh, Mr. McTaggart's thoughts, and I, I see the, the challenge, potential challenge um, there. I do think the way it's worded, as Mr. Lay pointed out, um, reduces um, concerns that it's as broad as broad as um is that and i would value seeing sort of an analysis um that would come with the package of it so i i would on balance probably leave it in at this point um mr laird i realize we have differing opinions um so <laughs> this may not be of great help to you um but i would probably go with mr lay um uh, on this Mr. McTaggart, now I know to look for your hand. Thanks. I'm just, I'm just the, the part I'm reading from the ADCA opinion um, is where it's it's line 22, 23 on page 13 of 45. And it says the court's not persuaded by the state's argument because assessing how a business model might harm uh, facially requires a business to express this idea's analysis about likely harm. And I, and I think that they basically just said, we don't want you doing that. So here we are telling them to express their opinions about harm. And I feel like um, in a cybersecurity audit, everything else is pretty cut and dried here, but this one, um, so if, if you are gonna leave it in, I'd love to see an analysis as to why it, this would survive uh, when the court just threw something out that basically said the same thing. So I think, uh, you know, at a minimum, um, the, potential questions have been raised. Mr. Laird, is that sufficient information for you to, uh, for for legal division to um, build into its analysis um, or do you need direct? I, I suppose I just want to clarify, it sounds like then it is still the staff's discretion based on our assessment of that provision to include or 
not. I think I just need some. Okay, thanks, Mr. Laird. Ms. De La Torre. Um, I just um, wanted to add to what Mr. Mataria just um, mentioned. Um, there's the uh, piece of the current litigation or past litigation, but I, I think also we have to be mindful of the skills that professionals have. And information security professionals are not necessarily um, trained to assess psychological harms, um, and they are responsible for these kind of assessments. So there could be a little... I think there's a, a, a lack of alignment in terms of the experts that will be doing this kind of um, um, security audit, their knowledge, and and what we're asking for here. Uh, in my experience, information security professionals look for ways to prevent the fire, um, not that skill in identifying, you know, specifically, um, definitely psychological harms. Um, so that will be another argument to not not include that uh, sentence, but um, I'm not sure if that changes the opinion of the other board members. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, well, um, from a process perspective, Mr. Laird has asked um, for clear direction if we want staff to take it out. I think um, I understood that if the direction is staff could look into it more and in its discretion decide whether to take it out or, or, or leave it in before it comes back to us. That is another option that staff could work with. Is that correct, Mr. Laird? Yeah, absolutely, we can take that direction, yes. Okay, um, I'm, I'm still inclined to go with Mr. Lay's um, view because I think he um, has thought about this a lot. I know Ms. De La Torre has as well though. Um, and to allow for more considered um, review on the part of staff to Mr. Of Mr. McTaggart's sort of useful um, observation. So that would be my preference would be to give staff the discretion, understanding that we're gonna look at it again. Um, but if that is not the um, feeling of the majority of the board, then of course we will, um, we will we can ask them to take it out. Um, so uh, we do we do have to do a roll call vote finally, but I, I guess I'd like to check in. Um, my sort of very soft um, uh, straw poll sense is that uh, Mr. Lay and I would go with the route that gives staff discretion and ask them to look into it. Um, Mr. Worth was there, but I'm not sure where he is now. Yeah, that's fine. I'd like staff okay. to make the ultimate choice for it. Okay. Um, is that sufficiently satisfactory, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. McTaggart, um, for us to go ahead and move on? Sure. I just, before I, I finally vote, then I just want to kind of put us all on notice that if, if there's not a pretty compelling reason as to why this wouldn't trip over the same problems that the ADC, the, the ADC, A, <laughs> tripped over, um, there were a lot of A's, D's, and B's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'd like this, I'd like the eventual analysis to address how this differs from what the court said in that decision, because it feels like this is precisely exactly what they what they said they didn't want to see. So thank, um, thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Laird, is the way I are formulated it clear enough for our staff? Yes, it is. And I, I would just like to take the opportunity. Uh, I know Mr. McTaggart has raised the AADC decision. Um, it is something staff is aware of and is uh, continuing to evaluate as we make our recommendations on regulations. So I just want to assure that is certainly in our minds as we prepare proposals for this board. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Okay. Um, so I think that we have a plan. Um, I can formulate a motion while we talk about risk assessments. Is that, is that what's next? And are we ready to talk about those? Okay, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay are nodding. To whom shall I turn it over for a risk assessment discussion? Um, I'm going to lead that piece for the subcommittee. Okay. Um, just ahead. for clarity, are we voting now or are we going to? No, not well. I was just okay. going to put them together to save time, but yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So um, what we were hoping to do at the subcommittee level is just to highlight in the draft that we presented the areas that we think have. Um, 
undergone a bigger change for the discussion and then obviously be open to other comments that um, members might have on areas that are not necessarily areas that have changed um, substantially. So I would like to direct the, the, the um, attention of the board to page five, and this will be the, I think this is the clean version. This is 7150. Uh, B5, it starts with for board discussion. Um, this relates to the triggers, meaning what are the kind of um, activities that will trigger the obligation to conduct a data uh, privacy assessment. Um, the previous draft um, had a reference to the idea that use of personal data or training of automated decision technology or AI will trigger the assessment. Here, what has been added is sections A, B, C, D, and E, which- um, Lisa, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I couldn't find the page. Are we on the clean copy or the red line? I have I have the clean copy. So if you have the red line, maybe. So the clean, page five of the clean copy. I'm just trying to find my place. I yep. No, 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 take your time. It's 7150. Uh -huh. Whichever copy you are, 7150, uh -huh. and then go to subsection B, five. Thank you. Got it. And it starts with for board discussion. Is everybody there now? Yeah. Okay. So this is um, this subsection lists the um, basically a threshold for the um, risk assessment, and these particular threshold, the one on train, using data to train automated decision-making technology and AI has been modified to what uh, subsections A through E. Um, and those um, aim at identifying the kind of ADMT technology or AI technology that will be in a way high risk enough to trigger the assessment as opposed to just imposing across the board to any ADMT or AI technology. The threshold selected are um, any of the processing set for in subsection B3. That subsection B3, as a reminder, is um, listing um, selling or sharing, um, sensitive personal information, um, use of ADMT for decisions that produce um, legal or similar significant effects, um, profiling, um, and there's two categories of profiling and then behavioral advertising. So it's a call back to the other um, thresholds. Um, wait, uh, I'm, I'm misreading here, apologies. So the, the cross references to B3, which excludes selling and sensitive personal information is the use of automated decision-making technology uh, for um, decisions that produce, produce legal or significant the, uh, or similarly significant effects. And, and then the two profiling and the behavioral advertising. Um, the second kind of AI system or ADMT system that will trigger um, the requirement um, when the data is used for training the algorithm is um, establishing individual identity on the basis of biometric information. And the third one is facial speech or emotion detection. Um, the next one is the generation of deep fakes. And the final one is the operation of generative models, such as large language models. Um, we review the language at the subcommittee level. We feel that is interoperable with other um, legal frameworks um, that are aiming at regulating AI. And so we feel comfortable with putting forward this proposal, but we wanted to call this to the attention of the board to make sure that they Everybody understands it's new, um, it's a limitation, um, but uh, we believe it's sufficiently broad to address what would be at risk um, in, in ADMT and AI. Um, should we take you comments on, yeah. I so. so I think so, this is this is new to address ADMT specifically. So I think it's a good time to find out if um, board members have um, specific reactions since we discussed most of this material um, in our last meeting, but not this part. Mr. Worth, and then Mr. McTaggart. 
yeah, I just wanted to go back to that comment. I want to make sure that you all do feel that it's not too specific. That it's not too detailed. And it's hard to know today what we're going to be thinking about five and 10 years from now in this world because it's evolving so fast. So I just wanted to make sure everybody feels that there's a lot of experience on this board with this, which is why I'm not really asking the board to confirm that they think this is broad enough to cover where we think this language needs to be years out. So I think that's an excellent question. And we have struggled with it because there's so many changes happening in the area. And, and you know, how do you set your thresholds at the adequate level with something that has been on our mind? Um, the two comments that I will have back are um, one, these are rules, which means that um, we can reshape them in one or two years if we feel there is need for it. I think that's a great advantage that we have versus other legislative processes that may be more um, uncertain in terms of whether you can change uh, or not. Um, so that, that gave us some level of, um, of kind of um, reassurance um, and then the second thing that we did that I mentioned before is we looked at other frameworks and how they were thinking about high risk. And we, we're not one-on-one -on -one to other frameworks in that, uh, for example, we don't regulate the public sector, et cetera. But we look for thresholds that will align or be compatible. Um, um, and the last thing, and I think that this is more for our general counsel, but in terms of the specificity, when we are drafting, in rules, we are also accounting for the fact that there is a review process with the administrative office in California. And so our language, if it's not specific enough, could um, find itself in a situation where the Office of Administrative Law doesn't consider that it's clear enough and then we can have that challenge. So we work with the staff to make it concrete enough that we feel that um, administrative review could, could not be problematic. Um, I'm not sure if that addresses the comment. I think it's a very valid comment and um, we, we have done our best to um, aim at something that's helpful right now and, and, and flexible towards the future. Thank you, Ms. No, I think that's a great answer. I appreciate yeah. it, thank you. I was indeed going to offer the Office of Administrative Law um, item if Ms. De La Torre did not. Um, in California, regulations are required to be have very high levels of, of clarity and specificity. And that does mean they tend to be quite specific, um, but we can amend them. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Uh, can you come off mute please, Mr. McTaggart? Sorry, I thought I pushed it. Um, are you looking just for comments on this section, the sub paragraph five, or or when would be appropriate to give you? That was the that was that is the topic under discussion at right now. Just five, okay. I, I'll I'll hold off then. I have comments on the whole thing. Okay, thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, and if you can if you can think of bundling them together into things that we should talk about here and things that staff can hear from you one way, that would be helpful. Um. I really appreciate the subcommittee's thoughtful work here um, uh, in terms of, as Mr. Worth alluded to, trying to catch a very quickly evolving situation with enough flexibility that we are able to help businesses um, and consumers with guidance while being concrete enough to do the same and also to meet the specificity requirements um, under the uh, Administrative Procedures Act in California, and also harmonizing um, with other um, regimes um, to the extent that that makes sense for California and for the rules that we're instructed by our law to create. Um, on that, I did have um, uh, some concern about some language that I recognize from another regime and how it might play here. I want to preface this by saying that this would in this does not mean that I would um, not vote to advance this. Um, I would. I still, you know, I I tend to think that um, a lot of work has gone into all of these rules, and um, it's time to work for public feedback and 
um, and, and input from the economists and so forth, but legal or similarly significant effects. Um, that's a term that I recognize from Article 22 of the General Data Protection Regulation. And I realize that um, Colorado has also used a similar concept. Um, so on the face of it, I think it would seem as though that would carry meaning with it that would be helpful. I will simply express a concern that I think staff is well placed to eventually, you know, to, to look at and tell me if I'm wrong. Um, with clarity um, for what is perhaps a slightly counterintuitive reason, which is that it is so similar or identical to words used in another jurisdiction with a very important law um, that we are certainly inspired by, but is not our law and is not within our um, overall sort of legal and constitutional regime. So the GDPR um, has a different set of defaults from the CCPA, for example. Um, the default is no processing, um, where that is not our default. Um, similarly, there's a contestation right um, in Article 22. Our law has um, opt-out and informational access rights, um, and it looks a little bit different. When you layer on um, the same words to a different regime, I'm not entirely sure how it plays, and our law doesn't actually have the specific limitation in it. Um, the limitation is in the GDPR for reasons that are best understood by the people who drafted it. Um, but um, it is a limitation that goes with a different set of defaults. Um, and, and thus, while I certainly um, don't think this is worth not advancing the language, it is something that I do have some concerns about and would like um, for uh, us to be sure that we understand it before we add in this limitation that doesn't exist in our law using language that exists in another law that has a different set of defaults. Um, all of that said, um, again, I commend the subcommittee for its work. And again, we could amend it um, if it seems that people are confused or that the defaults we've ended up with have not been set in the right place. Um, but I did want to point it out. Um, thank you for that comment, Chair Urban. I um, didn't mention that in my list of new things because it's really not new, it's a defined term. It seems that it's not been added to the definition section here, but we we will, it's defined. And I, I'm just wondering if maybe we should move that conversation to the last piece, which is the ADMT, because I know that the definition is there. I just don't see it here in the... I've seen that. Yes, I've seen the definition. Right. So this, is it fine to mean exactly the same that we had in the, sure, in the prior language? Yep. Yeah. So okay. there's no no actual change there in terms of the new rules, but I I, I hear your, your the, comment. Right. The um, two rules are new to us, though. Right, right, right. So um, do we want to have a... Do you... Do you want to talk about whether that term should be redefined or? I think we can hold it until we talk about the ADMT, I, I where I it is defined. And I think I've basically said what, I, what it might be. Uh, Mr. Lay? Yeah, you know, I, I think the idea there was, you know, it, it isn't extremely necessary to, to label it legal or significant effects. You know, the Venn diagram of, you know, our conception and, you know, other uh, jurisdictions you know, conception of legal significant impact. There's a lot of overlap, but you're right. It's not 100%. I think it was there uh, kind of, it's more related to, you know, the concept of having a, a easily named right um, for, for understanding. But, you know, I think you know, we take your point. Um, and, and, you know, I think we were aware that the, the overlap wasn't 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Yes, I. it is one of those oddities of law that you can, attempt to aid understanding and not. Um, and I don't know that that's how this would work out here. I just noticed it. Um, Mr. McTaggart, did you want to actually, let me pause and just say, are there more comments on this new material before I ask Mr. Mc okay. All right. Um, Mr. McTaggart, do you want to talk about some of your other comments or Ms. De La Torre, were you planning to introduce other things first? We have two more things that are new and then we can open it to everything that might come from the board in terms of comments. Okay, is that all right? If I could go. Yeah. Okay. okay. Go ahead. So the the other thing, and I take it that that piece that is new, there's consensus around keeping it the way it is, is that 
the summary of our conversation? I am not asking to change it um, in order to advance the package to the next point, no. Okay. If you have concerns. Okay. Um, so the next piece that is new, um, and this is more minor, but um, the for me, it's page 18 is in section 7156, timing and retention requirements for risk assessments under A3. Again, it starts with for board discussion. Um, is the idea of uh, this, whether automated decision making, um, sorry, whether um, risk assessments should be uh, periodically reviewed and what should be the cadence for that review? Uh, typically, and that's part of the rules, um, there's a requirement to obviously review your risk assessment when your activities change. Um, but this is in addition to that. Is there a need to um, review these assessments annually, biannually, every three years, uh, whether the activities that the business is engaged in um, have changed or not? Um, and that language is new. I think that we got some feedback last time. I, and I want to recall that the consensus was around uh, three years. It's not necessary to require it. We could just allow business to update this when their activities change. Um, but um, we will welcome any feedback that the board has. If anybody has a strong opinion on, on this piece, how often um, it should come up for review. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I mean, I think it's attractive because it helps businesses have a regular process, whatever the time period is, and it helps consumers know that they can rely on that regular process um, via, via the agency. Um, that said, again, you know, I think it's going to be a little mysterious to us what we're asking in terms of cost and so forth um, until we hear um, more. So, I would be in favor of including it, and I'm agnostic as to the time frame. I think it things are moving quickly; they're not moving instantaneously. Um, um, and so, again, I would be happy with kind of any of these thresholds. Um, Mr. Worth, were you? Did you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering if in in, in the section right above it, it's a three year, you know, regardless of the business change or not. Um, why not just tie them together so they're doing it all at the same time? Right. That, that's exactly, I mean, I, th I think that's intuitively what we're aware with the subcommittee because there are other three-year uh, periods. And I will say my personal opinion is that um, you don't want to make this short. They, it takes a long time to do a, a risk assessment. It's not a 10-day you know, process. It, it's a longer process. So I will definitely be speaking against the idea of doing it every year, I will be open to just not require periodical assessment so long as there's a requirement that when activities change, there's an assessment. But if the board would prefer, like Ms. Uh, Mrs. Servan mentioned, to have like this time requirement for all assessments to be reviewed, um, I will lean on, on the longer period, like the three year. That makes sense to me. I think Mr. Worth made a very good point in terms of efficiency. We have, of course, we don't want businesses to feel like they have to rush so that they're not doing a full job either. Um, I just continue to be aware of my own limitations and knowing exactly what all of this means um, from the perspective of the businesses doing it. Um, and indeed, we'll just have to wait and see to some degree. Um, we'll have to wait and see what comes out of the process. Um, we could amend it later. Um, but again, like I would like to just go with something and hear from people with direct knowledge um, what it would mean. Uh, Mr. Lay? Yeah, and <clears throat> this is maybe, you know, cheating a little bit, but, you know, it's within this section, but, you know, at, at uh, 7156C, you know, the, there's a saying, you know, businesses should conduct, you know, the first risk assessment for processing operations done before um, the effective date of these regulations. It says 24 months. I think given um, that these, these regulations are out and um, there's already you know, gonna be uh, some time in between, 
you know, maybe reducing that to 12 months would be the better, better move since businesses have a lot of uh, advance notice. But that that is just for me, um, you know, wanted to get any thoughts while we're in this section. I see. Yeah. So integrating the timelines all together, um, as Mr. Worth pointed out, um, maybe we're asking businesses to have a set schedule with time to um, do updates and so forth. Maybe we need to ask for the initial effort um, with a slightly tighter time frame, given that these have been before the public since September, um, I think. Okay. Um, Mr. McTaggart, I, or Mr. sorry, Ms. De La Torre, I didn't mean to say so Let's allow Mr. McTaggart to share first. I, I, I'm happy to let the discussion go on the on the timing because I don't have very strong feelings about that. So I, I, okay. I I'll come back with sort of some bigger. I mean, some yeah. different comments. I I am um so the, I am aware of the fact that this draft has been out for a while. Uh, however, I I also want to remind the board that um the way we are proposing to do automated decision-making and these piece risk assessments is very broad um, compared with what has been proposed or required by other jurisdictions. Um, and specifically, there's a piece of it, which is employment, which has not been required by any other jurisdiction in the US. And this is because we have a different scope of our law. So I will be mindful of that when we think about, you know, how much time will it require to complete one of the assessments. And also, um, it is fraud to start performing an assessment without the rules being final, uh, because you could be, you know, including work that doesn't need to be included or excluding work that needs to be included, um, since there's going to be changes. Um, so um, I will lean on not expediting or requiring a a, you know, a, a faster um, time to come into compliance because I think this is a very big ask for compliance teams and I want to make sure that they have the time, the knowledge, the ability um, to do it uh, in a way that is um, of substance and, and, and they're not overwhelmed with 12 months where there's you know, more work than maybe a, a compliance team can necessarily uh, easily undertake. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, further comments on, on this topic? I would point out that no matter what else happens, there's going to be significant more lead time um, because we still have to have all of the preparation of the package, the um, uh, economic analysis, which I understand takes months at a minimum, um, go through the entire rulemaking process, which we've been through going, you know, quite quickly. I'm so proud of us for going as quickly as we could. So there's going to be a lot of lead time no matter what we do. Um, so is so there was a third um, item you wanted us to focus on specifically, Ms. De La Torre? Yes, yes. And I think that we have the feedback for 7158A2, which will be studied at three years. Um, just for clarity, that's, I believe, the feedback that we received on that one, the periodical update. Um, the last one thing that we wanted to point out as new is at the end of the rules, um, and is section 7150A. This is about submission of the risk assessments to the agency. Um, the mandate on the agency in terms of submission uh, from the law is that there has to be some form of submission, but there is no clear, um, or, or there is no requirement that the submission be every year, every two years, you know, when the um, um, impact assessment change. So there is a lot of flexibility in terms of how this provision can be set. Um, the staff drafted something that's, I think, two pages and a half. So it's, it's, it's very detailed. And we can allow um, them to answer any questions that um, the board might have. Um, 
and, and I, I also have a personal opinion on it, but um, I want to hold that back to hear the feedback from other board members on this uh, formal obligation to submit annually that the staff has drafted. Um, so should we uh, allow the staff to present or do we want to go to comments from the other board members? Well, I think that you have been much more closely um, involved in the conversation than I have. It makes sense to me to find out if um, legal division folks who worked on this want to comment and then um, and then go to board members. Sure, happy to. I might ask uh, Ms. Nilifer Sheikh to join us if she's available. Ms. Sheikh, welcome. Hi, yes. Um, I'm happy to walk through the submission requirements that are currently in Section 7158. And so you'll see that there are different uh, pieces that are addressed in 7158. So the first, uh, 7158A, just goes to the cadence of submission, which would be an annual submission period. Um, there currently is a 24-month period as a placeholder for the first submission in line uh, with board member Lay's feedback, we could reduce that to 12 months. Um, and so that's something for the board to consider. Part B is actually what must be submitted to the agency with each annual submission. The B1 addresses a certification of compliance that would be submitted with the risk assessments. Uh, it provides a bit more detail, but in short, it just explains that a business would have to actually certify compliance with the risk assessment requirements as part of its submission. Uh, B2 goes into what actually would be submitted, which would be the risk assessment in abridged form. And B2 outlines what is an abridged form of a risk assessment that would have to be submitted. B3 gives businesses the option to also include a hyperlink to a public web page that includes its unabridged risk assessment. Uh, 7158C outlines the method of submission, which would be the a risk assessment submission web page. And 7158D outlines that the risk assessments should also, will, must also be provided to the agency upon request. So that's generally at a high level how 7158 works, which is outlining the timing of when things must submit, be submitted, what actually must be submitted, C is how it will be submitted, and D makes clear that the agency can also request these uh, risk assessments upon request. I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions about these specific provisions. Hey, Ms. Shake. Uh, questions are um, further comments from board members. Okay, Ms. De La Torre, you mentioned that you had um, comments yourself. Um, so the last um, section, the risk assessment shall be provided to the agency. I do believe that we should amend that to mention that it should be provided either to the agency or to the AG if the AG was to request it. And um, other than that, my um, point of view is that we should encourage the staff to simplify anything that is formal paperwork as opposed to substance work on identifying risk and, and setting um, measures of control. So um, thinking about whether the submissions could be biannual instead of annual, or whether there is a way to create a more summarized version that will suffice for the submission will be things that I will value. There is a cost in time to do anything. And to me, the value of the risk assessment is not in the submission, but it's in, in the fact that it's thoughtfully performed and um, it's available to the agency at any time. If, if we request, that will be the full version. Um, so this to me is more of a formal requirement that has to be part of the regulations because it's, it's required under the law that there has to be some submission. But I will appreciate um, if the staff could revise this, thinking about how they can um, make it easier for organizations to comply um, and um, be mindful of the time that it can take to um, just summarize documents and present them um, on a regular basis when we know that um, the agency has access to the full report at any time. Thank you, Ms. Ellsworth. Um, Mr. Laird or Ms. Jake, did you want to comment? Is Ms. Delatoire invited? Yes, yeah, so on the timing, I do think that is something that 
it would be helpful to get board direction on. Um, so staff has recommended an annual submission. Uh, board member De La Torre, based on your feedback, you are also asking for consideration of a different timing cadence. And so if other board members do have feedback on this specifically, that would be helpful for staff to consider. Um, yeah, this, I think, you know, the, I, I, I like the idea of annual, but at the same time, if nothing is changing, right, they haven't, they're not updating their, their risk assessments that, you know, perhaps whenever it's updated uh, could be helpful. And then it, maybe the assumption is there's no changes in between, but, you know, that's, that's very early thinking, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with the language as is, um, but yeah, that's, that's. The, the other option I could think of. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. McTaggart? Yeah, I'd, I'd support what Mr. Lay just said. Uh, you know, annual, but if nothing's changed, no requirement. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Other thoughts? Ms. Shake, I, oh, sorry, Mr. Worth, go ahead. No, I just just say I'm, I'm fine with that too. Um, Ms. Shake, is that sufficient for you? That is helpful. I, I appreciate the feedback on that. And then we will also take board member De La Torre's note just generally about, you know, how to further streamline these regulations. And so um, in whatever ultimate motion happens on the risk assessment, if staff could have discretion to just streamline the regulations for readability, for clarity, and, you know, to simplify as possible, that's just something I'm going to throw out there as potentially helpful as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think that should be pretty much standard for for anything that we we send on um, at this point. My I appreciate everybody's thoughtful um, analysis of the meaning of these as with others um, for for compliant businesses. Um, I still have in mind the other timeline, which is actually getting the regulations um, in a in a form that we get public feedback and getting them done. So all of these timelines are um, somewhat speculative um, uh, until we, um, given the, the length of time for rulemaking. So I'm happy to go with the 12 months for the first submission. I'm happy to um, go with other board members' thoughts about the ongoing submissions. And um, and I think, um, I think, you know, those are, I think Ms. De La Torre, hopefully um, we've discussed the questions you had on this one. Uh, Mr. Uh, I think perhaps maybe it would be helpful to get uh, Mr. McTaggart and Mr. Worth's opinion on the first submission, uh, just so we can get yeah. clear direction for staff. Sure. Could it be 24 months for the first submission or 12 months, knowing that, you know, probably these regulations won't be effective until, you know, quarter two, quarter three of next year. And that's all speculative. Yeah. Mr. McTaggart or Mr. Worth, do you have a thought? Yeah, I just think I, I appreciate that they're not going to be out for a while, but when you start with something new like this, I think it's just going to be a lot of heavy lifting for folks to get it into their normal routine. And so I was fine with the 24 months. Um, if you think the 12 months is really important, um, I could agree with that. I just think 24 would be helpful to the businesses starting something new. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, I, I agree with Mr. Worth. I, I think um, it's the first time it's, it's going to be a lot of work. So I, I go for longer. Okay. All right. I, I, I agree with that point of view as well. Okay. Um, and I continue to express my lack of expertise on the people who are in the building doing the thing. So I don't feel strongly about this. I very much appreciate Mr. Lay's um, observation about the other timelines. Um, so, uh, Ms. Sheikh, I think that we are in a sort of a general consensus that we go ahead and leave it at 24 months. That works. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, at this I point, we, we want to open it for feedback yeah. from the board okay. across the board for all of the... Um, and uh, Ms. McTaggart, I know, had um, some thoughts um, on different parts of the risk assessments. Um, so, Mr. McTaggart, I'll invite you now um, to offer those and just remembering that some things can go um, through through staff if it's not something that you're concerned about talking about in public. And of course, if you are, please bring them up. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, I I, I think um, so. I have some more granular comments, but I, I guess one thing, kind of stepping back, what, what I'd love to find out, you know, having now seen these changes, which are pretty extensive, and 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 you know, realizing this is it always was going to be a lot of work. I'm just wondering, I would love to see from staff an assessment of, and, and, and Chair Urban, you were talking about GDPR and it, there are some parts when I've, and I'm not an expert in GDPR, but when I've looked at it, there's some parts I think we do better. I'd like our do not sell a mechanism better, but I'd be really interested to know how is their privacy impact assessment? How are their risk assessments working? And um, we, we do kind of nod at it, talking about allowing other jurisdictions, you know, if you satisfy them, do you satisfy us? But, you know, they've, they've, they've had a, they've had a regime that's been in place for five years. It covers all businesses, big and small, and it has a requirement for these, for these risk assessments. And I'd love to know um, how, how, how it's working because there, I, I, I'd like to, if it is working okay, and there's not some massive problem with it, could we have a situation where we say, yeah. And if you supply, if you, if you uh, meet the GBR test, you can submit it here. And I'm, I'm, I don't have any sort of pride of it has to be invented in California if 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 it's functioning there, because I do think, you know, that's the largest trading block in the world. We're the fourth largest economy in the world. And if the standard is working there, uh, part of me says, um, you know, that that might be something to consider. So I'd love to just know, um, and I don't have to know right now, but, it, you know, if as part of this, if we could get a sort of an assessment of uh, this is um this is a this is a possible avenue or, or or not to to consider because it certainly would uh make it easier on businesses if you just have kind of one global standard you have to you have to uh, adhere to so that's that's kind of my, my my biggest kind of picture that's thing and then um mr mctaggart i think mr lay might have an observation on that big okay. picture point is that right and mr. yeah just just quickly um you know i think if you're doing a DPIA in the you know the EU, you're you're already very close to to finishing your California one. I think California rules go um, further where where necessary. Um, and you know beyond that, I think there, you know there's been a lot of debates on the effectiveness of you know DPIAs. But one thing that these rules do uh, better is there's more public disclosure, at least in the abridged version. Um, on what businesses are actually doing in these risk assessments. I think that's been one of the flaws of the GDPR models. We don't get a lot of DPIA results, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. And I know staff has done a lot of analysis on, on this and we, we've talked about that a lot. Um, so I'll stop there. And, and I think Mr. Sultani has a point to make as well. Thank you, Mr. Lay. And I assume that that would go into the initial statement of reasons or, you know, some some explanation um, in the reasoning for the provisions. Um, Mr. Sultani, and then Ms. Dilatory. Thank you, Chair Urban, and um, Mr. Dagger, thank you for the comment. Absolutely, I, I think um, your instincts are right in the sense that there's been, as you know, five years of experience with under GDPR. Um, and staff have um, consulted and reviewed both um, kind of Colorado's approach and the GDPR approach and incorporated that. There's portions of the language that say, if you comply with these other jurisdictions, here's some similarities. And 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 I imagine, you know, the, the compliance folks will build crosswalks um, to our heart's content. Um, one of the benefits of our participation in the GPA, the Global Privacy Assembly, is I've been able to meet and staff has been able to meet with num a number of um, regulators across Europe and Asia, and uh, we have talked at length as to how they um, kind of what they see in their DPPIAs, how effective they are, what's what works and what doesn't, and that has informed quite a lot of our reasoning. You know, as I said, it's been five years since they've been doing that. I think there is also opportunity to improve on that to make that more significant. So I won't share who, but one regulator we spoke to receives numerous, you know, uh, his, uh, um, DPIAs, and they're uh, I think they're they're scheduled to to release um, an assessment, a kind of a, a holistic summary of what their experience has been, which um, colored some of our. Um, of our insights, and they essentially say most DPIs they review um, rarely give them the the results they need. They almost always have to go back for more information, and that's what in fact informed how we structured our DPIs. So just just know that we've had a lot of that conversation with our counterparts, um, and uh, we've incorporated some of that feedback into um, our, our approach. 
Thank you, Mr. Sultani. And I am always happy if section 1798.199.40i um, is mentioned. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of, of that provision. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Uh, so I, um, you know, I have done data protection impact assessments. I have reviewed data protection impact assessments. The um, feedback that we thought we originally got from the board, and I don't think there has been a change on this, was to not look so much at Europe as to look at other states and be mindful of um, the power of you know, the, our rules in terms of helping set a national standard. And that's where my attention has been rather than um, the European experience. I do have to say that two things, um, you know, these documents are long. Um, they can be 80 pages. Um, they can be 40 pages. They are not five pages. If you have a data protection impact assessment that's five pages, you, you probably didn't pass the bar in any jurisdiction that I'm familiar with. So it's a significant undertaking. And um, the second thing that I wanted to mention is that for California, one of the things that we have to be very aware of is the difference in the scope of what we regulate, particularly business to business communications and employee data is something that is not regulated by other states. And it's something that nobody has done for GDPR because GDPR never require employee data when the employee is based in California to be you know, um, subject to requirements. So there is gonna be a significant push and um, I think some of the members mentioned this, there's gonna be a significant push that will have to happen for compliance with our rules just because of the scope of what CCPA covers versus um, other jurisdictions. And it is, good to have details, but it's also good to find flexibility when we're providing guidelines for the data protection impact assessments. So I do see the point that Mr. Matagar mentioned, and I think uh, Director Sultani also mentioned, which is um, after reviewing a data protection impact assessment, the agency has the ability to go and ask more questions. And I do not anticipate that that will not be the case in most situations because these, these um, processes are complex. So industry specific processes might not be, even, even when you're trying to draft this data protection impact assessment to be clear, might not be necessarily initially clear to our staff because they might not be that familiar with what the specific industry is engaging in. Um, so to me, that's a call to find flexibility because the information can be available anyway uh, to the agency through questions after reviewing a data protection impact assessment. So um, that that to me is a call for allowing for flexibility in the preparation of the formal document um, because there's no limitation in the information that can be received by the agency after they review the document. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, that, that, is, that is helpful. Um, I wanna do a quick time check. Um, we've been talking for about an hour and 45 minutes um, and we do have 10 items on the agenda. This is in no way intended to um, limit uh, full conversation, um, particularly of course on this agenda item, um, but I do wanna be sure that we are cognizant of the fact that the ADMT regulations are coming before Mr. Worth, Mr. McTaggart and myself for the first time. And again, that the um, sort of stakes, if you if you think of it that way, um, do not include us not having a substantive feedback um, uh, on, on these rules again. All right, um, Mr. McTaggart. Uh, great, thank you. Um... So anyway, I, I think since I, I heard all that feedback on GDPR, I still think it would be useful. And I'd ask staff to consider having a section here which says if you comply with GDPR, here are the things you need to do for 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 you know uh, for California. And I I just think that I, I I hate having to you know I think I'm a big eighty twenty fan, and I think that the easier this is to implement, the more uh, widespread the adoption will be, and the better for consumers. 
And so I think if if business has, uh, and this is probably mostly just the big businesses that, that have business in Europe, but that's a lot of them, if they're already used to doing it one way and if it's not some big fatal flaw, I would urge us to to look at, and you know, to Mr. Lay's point, maybe it's okay, you have to have more transparency here and here that, you know, here's the sort of list of things. So if you've already complied with GDPR, go to section this one. And, and so that, anyway, that's one thing. Um, then specifically, uh, you know, within the actual document, I, I do have some, 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 some comments. One is this notion of profiling consumer when they're in a publicly uh, accessible place. The GDPR construct is the systematic monitoring of publicly accessible areas on a large scale. What we're saying is uh, slightly different. We're saying it's based on where you are. But so if I'm walking in the street and I'm on Yelp looking for a Chinese restaurant, that's what this is now. Uh, or if I'm Google, if I'm on Google Maps or Apple Maps, that's 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 now profiling me. Or if I'm getting an Uber, so I I I think that I prefer the the GDPR construct because this is just if you happen to be in a public place and you're using a software, you're now into this into this world. So I, I think it's more all of our concern is more around surveillance on a large scale. You're walking along, you don't even know you're getting surveilled. So that's one concept I have. One one comment I have there. Um, in terms of the risk assessment requirements, so this is now a uh, section uh, 7152. I, I just want us all to think about what we're going to be getting. So like, for example, 1A says, you know, we have to, the business has to say why they're using the automated decision-making as opposed to manual processing. And yet our decision of automated decision, our definition of automated decision making is so broad, it's basically software. Like any any time it it helps you make a decision. So so now we're gonna be saying to every business, essentially, why are you using your software? And for little businesses that are you know, little, but are not software businesses that develop the software themselves, it's like, why did you buy this accounting software and not another one? Um, and so I, I, you know, that, that struck me as we're gonna ask these questions and, the 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 overarching uh, aim of this section is to improve privacy and security. And I don't think that does. Um, and then um, the the you know we're getting pretty granular about in a risk assessment. In this is now. Same seventy one fifty two five G, and we're saying if you know if they're using the automated decision making to determine compensation for its employees, we're ask them how it uses the compensation, how it uses the output to determine the actual uh, compensation, and, and I, I don't know. This feels like we're getting past what the actual function here is, you know, or number Mr. seven. Mr. McTiger, I'm sorry, could you clarify that a little bit? So remember for OAL, we have to be very specific. I, I kind of lost, I'm sorry, I just lost it. Lost what you were saying there. I, you know, I think, I think for a lot of the um, elements of the processing, For example, in number seven, we're asking them to tell us how much money they make from a from the sale or sharing of consumers' personal information, and this is in the risk assessment. That's, that's what they're saying that they they um, are using the you know if the benefit to the business is that they make money. And I, I guess I'm I'm it feels like we are, and getting into what I was talking about earlier, where we're really asking a business to get into um areas that are kind of far afield from the risk assessment of you know what's the what's the risk of processing the information feels different than than how are you using what's the output when you're using this software to determine compensation for an employee um and if you go to you know, section 
eight, the negative impacts to consumers' privacy association, all of that feels, again, going back to the age appropriate design code, I, I look at all that stuff, the constitutional harms, the political participation, the religious activity, free association. I'm, I'm like, wow, this is, this is requiring businesses to start weighing in on the uh, discrimination harms and the disparate impact upon protected classes. I don't think that that's where um, the, uh, I don't think that's where the, um, where we should be going with this. And so I, I, I just thought it was, um, I, I thought there could be some cutting back here in terms of the uh, section 71, the risk assessment requirements. Section 71. 7152. 7152, thanks, Mr. McTaggart. If it's all right, I'd like to pause you again because I think Mr. Lay and Ms. Shake mm -hmm. may be able to clarify or respond. Yeah, Ms. Shake, why don't you go first? Absolutely. Um, I think there's just two points that I wanted to make with respect to section 7152. So for example, in the um, example about estimated profit, it is because one of the things that must occur in a risk assessment as required by the statute is an assessment of whether or not the benefits outweigh the risks. And so if an estimate, if an expected benefit is monetarily profiting off of a consumer's personal information, what that estimated profit would be, we believe would impact the assessment of whether or not the uh, benefits outweigh the risks. With respect to the actual negative impacts identified, of course, we're happy to, of course, take fee board feedback on how to streamline these regulations. Those are generally, um, we, we did look to what other states such as Colorado have identified as risks for consideration. And in the interest of interoperability, we've tried to use a similar framework. Um, but again, I, I do think this would be, um, particularly when we receive individual board member feedback um, to further refine the regulations, it is something that we're happy to take back. Thank you, Ms. Shake. Um, it's helpful. Yeah, you know, I, I was just going to say that that's exactly the point around the risk benefit analysis. You know, if you don't know the benefit, then how can you estimate whether, you know, the risks of your processing outweigh those benefits? Um, and, you know, I think the idea here is that, you know, companies, when they have so much data on you, right, there's a huge information and power asymmetry that that occurs. And, you know, that can create risks of discrimination and other types of harms um, due to the ownership of that data. So the idea here is so that, you know, you have a lot of power as a business and, you know, it's upper limits around 29,000, 30,000. Um, making sure that now that you have all this power, you're using it responsibly. So that is really the goal around here um, on, on a lot of these regulations uh, as the subcommittee drafted them. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I mean, I really do take Mr. McTaggart's point here, but I want to underscore, um, well, I don't know, I don't have the power to underscore, but I will repeat with, with, um, with uh, affirm what, um, Mr. Lay said about requiring an actual assessment of benefit. This has been a problem with cost benefit analyses for decades in terms of being able to actually understand um, what the trade-offs are on the part of the public. So I think that I really appreciate the subcommittee taking that into account as well as taking into account other jurisdictions as Mr. Lay um, laid out so clearly a few minutes ago. Um, I very much appreciate um, all that work and I think um, that um, listening to the conversation helps me see um, uh, a lot about some of the choices here. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Um, I'm sorry, Ms. De La Torre, could you come off mute? Thank you. I appreciate the discussion and the, and the thoughts um, shared. Um, I wanted to highlight a, a few things. Number one, this section, this section on risk assessments, um, doesn't have a threshold, meaning if you're a small organization, medium organization, you're going to be required to perform these risk assessments as if you were a large organization because that's, we, we have set it up without threshold. So when we look at these requirements, we have to think about how they apply not only to larger organizations that might have compliance teams that are able to do these assessments, but also small organizations that might not even have a general counsel. 
and that will be required to perform these kinds of assessments. So I take um, Mr. McTaggart um, comments to also be inclusive of that concern. In terms of um, the streamlining um, requirements, I think that there could be an opportunity to take a look at them. I do have to point out that I mentioned with the cybersecurity piece that um, it is typically the case that cybersecurity experts are not necessarily um, you know, trained to identify um, the kind of risks that um, are in this um, list of negative impacts. That's not quite the case for privacy um, compliance professionals. I think that we are aware and, and trained to identify negative impacts in a way that's more um, flexible, not necessarily so technical. Um, the last um, thing that I wanted to mention, and this might be part of the conversation that we have to have later when the staff presents their um, draft on the ADMT rights, is that um, the, the um, point that Mr. McTaggart mentioned on the definitions, how we define ADMT, it's, it's very relevant here because the definition is, is very broad. Um, so any use of technology to make decisions, basically, the way the definition stands right now will trigger an assessment of the risks and also potentially opt out rights. Um, but I'm not sure if that's something that we should have a conversation about here, or maybe we should wait for um, the staff to present the uh, rights section that they drafted. Okay, all right. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Um, uh, Ms. Sheikh or Mr. Laird, do you have thoughts about the about um, the order of the conversation? Uh, none from me. I, I think that would be fine to have that conversation. Okay. Further at the ADMT stage. Okay. Um, uh, thanks very much. Um, that makes sense to me um, as well. Um, all right, um, Mr. McTaggart. Thanks. Actually, Mr. Lee, that was that uh, that was well said about the about the benefits. So thank you. I I think probably my my is you know if I come down to it, it's it's I'm very worried about number eight in seventy one fifty. To this again, and and I take your point, uh, Ms. De La Torre, that that maybe the privacy professionals are more versed in figuring this out. But I look at the again what we're asking the businesses to um, weigh in on, and that feels large, you know, sort of mountainous in terms of what the all the potential harms are. Um, and then that that kind of also. Uh, spills over into the next section 7153 the additional requirements for businesses using automated decision making because again now they're going to have to tell you um their definition of equality and equity and discrimination harms uh they're going to have to say you know did we evaluate other versions of the automated decision making technology and we're talking about a business that bought software so now it's going to have to come tell you why they didn't buy another piece of software because essentially this is the definition of software. And so that's a, I'm not sure that that advances the, uh, the, the privacy conversation the way we may want to. Um, and did we test, I'm a business, I'm buying an accounting software that might recommend, remind me when to pay my bills or something like that, but it's making, it's helping me make a decision. Now I have to say whether I evaluated it for validity, reliability, fairness. It's, it, I, I think we're, I guess I think we're, we're uh, it's easy to add things on later when we have a mistake. If we'd like, okay, this is really, we, we need to add things on later, but I would start with less, I'm a big less is more, you know, fan to begin with. So I, I think um, we'll obviously see this again, but I, I, I am concerned about how much we're asking businesses to do here uh, that are not, I think, intuitive initially for a lot of them. Uh, thanks, Mr. McTaggart. I wonder if this also is something that we could bundle with the ADMT discussion, since I think there's significant um, overlap. 
Right. I, I think the question is, because there's two ways to think about solving. Um, one is to better define ADMT to avoid the situations that Mr. McTyra was mentioning, like, you know, software that might not be um, really making any decision. It's just used as an aid in making a decision. Um, so that's that's one thing. And and the, the other possibility will be to keep the definition broad, but perhaps reconsider the specificity in terms of the requirements for the um, assessment. So I wanted to ask Mr. McTaggart if either of those avenues will solve their, uh, the concerns that he raised or, or if he had a very specific preference for revisiting the list of requirements um, as opposed to revisiting the scope of the definition? Uh, you know, I, I think it's sort of, I'd, I'd have to see it, uh, how it worked. I, I, I think that the, the definitions of ADM and profiling are so vet, so so broad that they basically cover kind of all technology, all the use of technology. And then to evaluate why you're doing that as opposed to doing manual thing, well, of course you are because that's the world we live in. So I, I whether we, we limit the, you know the requirements for people who are going to do the risk requirements, or we limit the definitions. I'm 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 some, somewhat indifferent to, uh, and I and I think this is why un, was underlying my my comment about GDPR. Just I was like, wow, this is this is a tremendous amount of work to do, and if there's a, already a system that's working well, um, does it make sense? And I hear about Colorado, but you know the EU is what over 500 million people. That, that's a that's a pretty big um, uh, area to try to you know maybe to, to to align with if it's working. So. Um, anyway, uh, thanks. Thanks, Mr. I, I would like to. Ms. Mr. Lay and Ms. Jake both have their hands up. So yeah. if it's possible, I'd like to give them the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think the the validity, reliability, and fairness portions, you know, that that's part of the AI risk management framework. This is going, this is a small, tiny subset of what, you know, the National Institute of Science and Technology has said that everyone deploying, you know, automated decision systems, AI systems should be doing. So, you know, in my perspective, if you're make, you're having a decision, you're having a system that is controlling your access to healthcare, employment, you know, it's incumbent on the businesses who are making more than $25 million or processing certain amounts of data and making these decisions. So there's several layers of thresholds that limit the application of these rules. You need to know whether or not your system is reliable, valid, or fair. Um, and we're not saying you have to have any one definition, right, of reliability or fairness, but, you know, it's incumbent on you if you're making these critical decisions that you know if your system works or not. You know, there, there is a case just now where um, a, a Medicaid algorithm uh, allegedly denied people uh, health, health, you know, their claims 90% of the time erroneously. So, you know, I think businesses need to know this. They need to be able to actually assess this before they they release their products to make, you know, potentially life-threatening life, you know, very important decisions. So, you know, I think there's a real strong, once you have this much data on someone and you're using it to make critical decisions about them, you know, it is part, it should be part of any risk assessment that, you, you know, you, you've done this. Whether or not the idea about evaluating other types of systems, you know, that that is part of the disparate impact analysis is, you know, is there a less discriminatory alternative to the system that you've used? So this this gets at that. You know, I I you know I I hear your point. This may be administratively burdensome. So you know, there I, I'm willing to to consider you know staff proposals and other proposals about how do we get there. But I think at a minimum, you know, if businesses in California are making you know, these critical decisions, they have to assess whether their systems work. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I will say that we are balancing a number of different um, issues here in terms of where the burdens lie and the timing. Um, I take Mr. McTaggart's point that much of the time we can amend the regulations. These systems are being built and deployed right now. As Mr. Lay said, they are using massive amounts of personal information, sometimes very sensitive personal information. And three years from now, um, they are going to be affected how they work and how dangerous they are is going to be affected by how they're built. Um, those of us in the privacy and data protection world 
um, have a saying that it is always much easier to bake privacy in than to than to bolt it on afterwards. Um, and thus, I think, you know, given the subcommittees, again, two years of work on this um, and very thoughtful um, approach to it in this instance, and it's not the case for every instance, in this instance, I think that the better path um, is to start with a protective model and businesses can tell us and they absolutely should if it's not working, if the cost benefit analysis is too much, if it's just not something they can comply with. But right now these things are happening. Right now these systems are being built. And you know, um, if we like do something that um, doesn't take into account the issues that we know exist, um, it, in theory, I suppose we could tack them on later, but it's just going to be more cost on businesses. And in the meantime, we have consumers who've had, for example, their Medicaid claims denied for no reason, um, uh, sort of extrapolated. You know, I don't think we can know um, exactly how this is going to play out or exactly what the risk is. Um, but I think we absolutely need to keep in mind um, the way that technologies are built and deployed using personal information based on what we know from the past. This is in no way to say that I wanna burden businesses unduly at all. I definitely do not. Um, I just want to be sure that we're giving businesses the tools um, to build things um, in the best possible way. And that the businesses we are targeting are those who meet the thresholds under the statute, which of course um, they are. And those are businesses that either have um, relatively high revenues or use our data a lot. Um, and it's a large part of their business model. Um, so there, there is a risk there um, to the people of California. Um, so if we're going to, um, you know, err on one side right here, um, I would be in favor of erring on the side that would allow us to pull back um, if we don't need to, within reason, of course. But anyway, I'm sorry, Ms. Jake. Um, I was listening hard and I apologize. I completely forgot your hand was up and it's over the, the lock again. Um. No, no, thank you, Chair Urban. The only thing I was going to add to what Board Member Lay had said, um, just uh, as he had mentioned, it's not any use of ADMT that would trigger these requirements. It would be, one, you would have to meet the definition of business under the statute. Two, you would be using automated decision-making technology. And three, you would be using automated decision-making technology in one of the ways that is listed in the thresholds um, under 7150. And so it would not be all uses. Um, and the, the second thing that I wanted to just quickly raise is that the regulations do acknowledge that there may be instances where a business, for instance, is not the entity that actually developed the model. So for instance, if you receive the model from a service provider, uh, our regulations do require that a service provider assist you in completing the risk assessment so that you are not left in the dark. Similarly, under section 7154B, the entity that is training the model that you are using also must assist you in completing the risk assessment. The idea here is that the businesses who are using the models um, in one of the ways triggered under 7150B, if they don't have access to all information about the model, including how it was evaluated for fairness, that this information does need to be provided for the, to them so that they can themselves complete their own risk assessment requirements. And so they would not be left in the dark trying to comply with something that they don't have sufficient information to comply with. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, you know, just to Mr. Lay and Ms. Shea's point, I, I get that, except that's not what it says in the sense that if it were just about the Medicare and stuff, that would be a different, it was just the legal effects you know, the decisions producing legal effects, that would that would be one thing. But actually, when you look at the definition of ADM, which is to, you know, any co using computation as a whole or part of a system to make or execute a decision, which is pretty much any software, and the fact that this 7150 is for profiling a consumer when they're out in the street, it means basically any consumer who's using any kind of app in the street is now falling into this category. So that's a very different thing to me than you're being denied insurance or, or or a loan or or healthcare. So I I, I don't agree that that um Ms. Sheikh is is is, is on that point systematic is something that I would you know potentially like to add to to that that definition, right? But at least on the point of legal or similarly significant effects, you know, I guess what are your thoughts on you know 
I, I think the regulations definitely make sense when it comes to. Yeah, the I, I think I think you know that's why we and I, that's why I sort of like that construct of, of you know the, these big decisions that are that are important in terms of your you know your health your financial stuff feel different. And I, and also I, I liked the profiling for behavioral advertising because that's clear. That's a that's also we're trying to you know track you and but the but the ones that are sort of just I'm looking for a restaurant or I'm trying to find a car they don't feel this you know the same threshold. Ms. Dilatory and then Ms. Sheikh. Um, thank you. Um, so in the, the definition of decisions that produce legal or similarly significant effects concerning a consumer, which uh, Chair Urban brought up before, I just wanted to read it out loud. Um, so it means a decision that results in access to or the provision or denial of financial or lending services housing insurance, education enrollment or opportunity, criminal justice employment, or independent contracting opportunities or compensation, healthcare services, or essential goods and services. And I'm generally supportive of the definition. I have two questions on the definition is, um, so we say um, financial or lending services, housing insurance, education enrollment, or opportunity. And what's opportunity? Opportunity is, is, is not a clear line for me. Um, so if you don't accept somebody into an educational program, are you denying them an opportunity? Potentially, I think there is a possibility to make that a little bit more clear because I don't anticipate that that's what we will consider um, legal or significantly similar. Um, and the, the other one that I wanted to highlight is uh, employment. Not only employment, but also independent contracting opportunities. So if I'm a business and I am receiving proposals from several businesses, I'm gonna make a decision as to which one I will choose. Is that within the definition of decision that produces legal or similarly significant effects because we regulate business to business? Um, data. Those are the kind of things that I, I I think we could be a little bit more thoughtful around in our definition to make sure that we really um, cover what we mean, which is really significant decisions about individuals, not necessarily about um, deciding on which contractor you um, might hire. But I generally, like I mentioned, support um, the other pieces of the definition. I also wanted to take an opportunity to read out loud the definition of automated decision-making technology, which I think it underlines a lot of the concerns that Ms. Member McTyre share. And um, we say mm, automated decision technology means any system, software, or process, including one derived from machine learning, statistics, or data processing, or artificial intelligence, that process personal information and or uses computation as a whole or part of a system to make or execute decisions or facilitate human decision making. So I think that's the point that Mr. McTaggart is raising on, on, on the broad definition. And, and we can look at it from the definition or we can look at it from the requirements. I'm very supportive of the comments of Mr. Lay in terms of, and um, 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 Chairman Urban, in terms of these um, you know, systems that are making important decisions and how they need to be regulated. And I think that has been a lot of the attention from the subcommittee and I, I'm very supportive of it, but at the same time, I'm wary of saying that, you know, some, you know, use, any use of technology um, should, should trigger the kind of um, investment in doing a data protection impact assessment, or we will talk about rights on the other, on the other end, because I don't think that that's where the concern of the people is. I don't think that people are concerned about the use of technology. I think they are concerned about systems that make decisions without transparency or without human intervention. Um, and like I said, we can think about it from the perspective of whether we tailor the definitions or we set um, other um, thresholds around, around some of the requirements that we attach to those definitions. Thanks, Ms. Delatory. Ms. Sheikh, um, if 
sorry, I'll ask you for just a moment of patience, because I think we have inevitably entered the discussion of ADMT, and I'm just trying to think about the most efficient way um, to do this. Um, uh, Ms. Sheikh, maybe if you respond, and then I'll ask Mr. McTaggart if he has comments on risk assessments that aren't related to ADMT, and if he's willing um, to have that conversation about the thresholds for ADMT and sort of how they all fit together when we talk about the ADMT regulations. But I'll let him think about that. Ms. Sheikh, while you go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Urban. Um, with respect to the comments made by board members McTaggart and uh, board member uh, and uh, De La Torre, just wanted to clarify three things quickly. So first, um, with the profiling in publicly accessible places, board member McTaggart, I think this could just be an area of wordsmithing. The examples that we provided are really intended to give guidance on the types of technologies we're most concerned about being used in public, things like facial recognition technology being used in public, license plate recognition, things like that. So it's not actually intended to capture, you happen to be using an app while you're in a public place. But again, I think that's something where we can wordsmith this to make that point clearer. Um, and so I'm hoping that allays some of the concerns you have about the breadth of that specific threshold. Um, board member uh, De La Torre, on the use of the word opportunity, that's generally to get to the idea, again, of you know the decision to promote someone, to hire someone, to fire someone, those we saw as opportunities. But again, this is something that I think some wordsmithing could help alleviate your concerns about just making it more precise, making things clearer. On the definition of automated decision-making technology, we did review a variety of materials in putting forth this definition. We reviewed academic literature, propo other proposals by legislators, by um, civil society. In terms of refining this definition, it is something that we think would really benefit from the public comment process. We have reviewed as many secondary sources as possible on this, but you know the businesses who are actually using these technologies, we would absolutely benefit from what they actually you know, would recommend on tightening up the definition. So my recommendation would be to keep the definition as is with of course any additional feedback by the board at this time, but that we move forward with that definition largely intact for public comment and actually refine it once we get more technical expertise received via public comment. Thank you, Ms. Jake, it's very helpful. Um, Mr. McTaggart, what are your thoughts on um, continuing this conversation when we're talking about ADMT and maybe getting your thoughts on anything else in the risk assessments. Sure, I, I'm happy to just to, to, to continue this in ADMT because I think there is a lot of overlap. And I will say thank you to Ms. Delatore who said what I was kind of feeling much more eloquently than I did. You know, I, I, I am concerned about the breadth of the, of the, uh, of the um, definitions. And it's funny, I had underlined just that section of the legal decisions that it's the, it's the employment, the independent contracting, because at that point it's, Every time Uber assigns, you know, you the drive and not you the drive, and why did they assign that person? And that's independent contracting opportunities. Is that really what we want to be for the legal effects? You know, uh, so there's got to be, I think, some threshold or some kind of thoughtfulness about why DoorDash chose this driver and not that one to deliver your food to you. Um, and I think that's not what we want. And I think what Mr. Latore said was exactly right. We're concerned about these unknowable systems that say you're 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 going to get a you know, uh, healthcare and you're not. Uh, and the rest of the stuff I can take up with staff, but that was it, it, my main concern is that plus the whole AADCA uh, component in in, uh, uh, in item eight, the negative impacts that one. Okay, thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, other, um, other comments on risk assessments, um, especially, and then I will do a process, uh, like a, a process summary check in with everybody. Um, I'd like to go to public comment. Um, I think we um, may need a break. So if people want to think about that, um, trying to juggle a variety of different things um, to be sure we have a full conversation and get our, get, you know, manage to, to go through the agenda. Anything else on risk assessments? Okay. Um, so taking into account the, dis the whole conversation and where I understand these drafts draft maybe sub packages given Mr. Laird's um, note at the beginning about putting things together um, as staff needs to. Um, the, sorry, the different, excuse me, the slightly different points at which these packages um, 
are um, and all the um, subcommittees work that's gone into them. Um, I am going to suggest uh, first that we have a motion um, to direct staff to advance the proposed cybersecurity relations uh, regulations, excuse me, to formal rulemaking um, through commencement of the 45 day comment period, authorizing staff to make additional changes um, to, and Ms. Shake, I don't remember all the words you use, but to improve clarity, ensure compliance with the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, and the uh, streamlining for readability, because I believe that is one of the comments we received. Okay, streamlining for readability, recognizing everyone that this is to um, direct and authorize staff um, to continue the work. We will see it again before it comes back. And then with regard, or sorry, it will come back before it goes out for public comment. Excuse me, my apologies. And then with regards to the risk assessments, which we have um, considered in our last meeting, um, and the subcommittee and staff have done um, further work on, and we've heard um, some pretty um, uh, thoughtful comments from, from Mr. McTaggart and others. Um, there, I would request a motion um, to direct staff um, to uh, um, receive feedback um, on the draft from um, individual board members, as we have done with the cybersecurity requirements. Um, and to propose a revised draft um, uh, in a future meeting um, before we advance to formal rulemaking. And Mr. Laird, does that comport with um, what would work um, in order to help staff um, obtain the necessary economic assessments and so forth? I, I want to be sure I'm not splitting things up too much such that um, we are not getting the assessments, but also um, that we are making sure that staff has all the feedback that it needs and the board is able to, to give that feedback. I appreciate that. In this instance, I think we could accommodate sort of a motion of that nature and, and be able to turn around a new draft before before um, completing the rest of the documentation for, for preparation of notice. And would that be, um, and mm -hmm. that would... That would, I'm sorry to, I just want to be, um, I know we all have questions about the effect on businesses and the economics, and this would give you the ability to help work with the economists to, to um, give us recommendations with that sort of background expertise um, built in. Um, yes, although I think um, maybe I should just clarify. Um, I think the understanding would be that staff would have the opportunity getting feedback from individual board members and otherwise cleaning up the proposal to bring that proposal back to the board. Um, I anticipate in the next one to two meetings um, for final kind of not sign off, but to then com complete the rulemaking, I guess. Um, I mean, the sooner we can kind of get um, clarity on the parameters of the regulation, we can certainly start the economic uh, assessment. And I think um, as long as there aren't significant changes, um, at the next time the board sees the language, then we could begin at least that effort. Okay. I guess I'm trying to see if there is a way that we don't have to discuss the parameters again without having the full economic assessment. Um, and my understanding from the conversation is that we, for the risk assessments, we talked about um, thresholds in terms of um, how long businesses have to comply before they go into the um, but for their first, um, excuse me, for the first risk assessment, and then the cadence for other um, risk assessments. Um, and then there were um, as well um, some pieces of substantive feedback from Mr. McTaggart that are connected intimately with the ADMT regulations. Um, and I know he mentioned he has some other sort of one way comments. So I guess I'm asking if there's. I think I'm following now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I'm following now. Yes, absolutely. I think you could delegate sort of exactly that uh, level of responsibility to staff, we could proceed with development of the economic assessment and then return to the board sort of with the rest of the package, having taken into account any trailing individual feedback from board members. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I'm, I'm fully supportive of the proposed plan for cybersecurity, but I would like to hold back on board on what is the destination for the risk assessments until we finish the conversation because they are very, very interconnected with the ADMT rights. And I want to know where we are at the end of the conversation 
before deciding whether it most, makes more sense for them to go back to subcommittee or to be released to the agency. Uh, thanks, Ms. De La Torre. Yes, and we certainly wouldn't vote um, until we'd heard from the public. Your comment does um, raise for me a question, um, which is that I wonder if, so I have given you the outline of what I see as the motions I'm going to request right now. Um, I was thinking at the top of the conversation that we would then ask for public comment in order to sort of keep things um, relatively clean, but given that the risk assessments and the ADMT topics have been, have are, are, are connected, um, and I should have thought of that because of course they are in the language. Um, we could just we could just um, wait um, for public comment until we have the ADMT discussion as well. Um, or I could ask for public comment on the cybersecurity regulations specifically. Um, I would probably um, prefer to ask for public comment when we finish the ADMT um, uh, discussion as well. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, say that that's what we'll do unless um, anybody stops me because of course I could have missed something. All right, and then I'm gonna propose that we take at least a short break, um, uh, maybe 10 minutes. Okay, um, so let's uh, take a break and reconvene here um, at, let, just let me even it out. Let's make it 11.35 on my clock. Um, thank you everybody for a really robust discussion. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you again in 10, 12 minutes. Thank you. See you whenever the Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, then we will just wait a couple minutes for Ms. Delatory and Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Lay, am I reading the materials correctly that um, there's a slide presentation that staff will be presenting? Yeah, the okay. ADM. Okay, well, perhaps while we wait for Ms. De La Torre, um, staff could be invited to go ahead and pull that up and prepare. Sure, I'd ask Liz to go ahead and okay. put the presentation up. Thank you. I don't want to speak for uh, Ms. De La Torre, but you know, as you know, the subcommittee is pretty familiar with uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the 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 content that is to be presented. Perhaps we could start um, in the interest of time. Of course, I think that makes sense. And if you can speak for the subcommittee, then let's go for it. Um, I believe I will hand it over to Mr. Laird. Yeah, sure. And I'm just actually going to pass it directly again to our. <laughs> Excellent staff, uh, Ms. Kristen Anderson and Nilfer Shake. Thank you, Phil. Um, all right, well, Nilfer and I are part of the agency's team working on the draft automated decision-making technology regulations. Just as an FYI, we will sometimes use ADMT as shorthand just so that we're not saying automated decision-making technology literally every time. Um, as you all have seen, the draft ADMT regulations are posted to the agency's website as a meeting material but we thought that it would be helpful both for the board and the public to provide this walkthrough of the proposed framework that undergirds those regulations. So this morning, I'll be providing the higher level overview of the proposed framework to regulate the opt-out and access rights with respect to businesses use of automated decision-making technology. Nilifer will then provide more detail on some of the key components of the framework. And then finally, I'll return to some ter certain topics to facilitate board discussion, and we'll be happy to respond to questions from the board following this presentation. Next slide, please, Liz. 
And we'll actually go to slide three. Thank you. We'll begin with a reminder of the CCPA's delegation of authority to the agency. The CCPA directs the agency to issue regulations for governing access and opt-out rights for consumers with respect to businesses' use of automated decision-making technology, including profiling. It also articulates certain requirements for businesses' responses to consumers' access requests. As noted at the bottom of this slide, other jurisdictions have their own frameworks that govern the use of automated decision-making technology or profiling, such as the EU's GDPR and other state consumer privacy laws, such as the Colorado Privacy Act. We considered these other privacy laws and regulatory approaches in drafting the proposed framework and regulations. We do seek to harmonize to the extent that doing so is consistent with and furthers the intent and purposes of the CCPA. But the CCPA has its own scope and structure, which differ from those laws. For example, CCPA's delegation governing access and opt-out rights is not limited to solely automated processing or to pro profiling only in furtherance of decisions that produce legal or similarly significant effects. In addition, the CCPA's requirements apply to the personal information of employees, independent contractors, and job applicants. The proposed framework and draft regulations, therefore, are based upon the CCPA scope, structure, purpose, and intent. Next slide, please. This slide provides the proposed definition of automated decision-making technology, which includes profiling. The slide also excerpts the profiling definition from the statute. To be clear, the draft regulations do not regulate all uses of ADMT. While the definition is broad, a business's obligations depend upon whether the business's use of ADMT meets one of the thresholds outlined in the proposed framework and the draft regulations, which we'll turn to shortly. Next slide, please. There are three main components of the proposed ADMT framework, free use notice requirements, opt-out right requirements, and access right requirements. To be clear, where a business's use of ADMT meets the thresholds that we'll be going over on the next slide, it must comply with each of these requirements. To illustrate how they can work together, it may be helpful to think about them from a consumer's perspective. First, before a business can use its ADMT with respect to a consumer, it must provide that consumer with a pre-use notice. That notice gives the consumer information about the business's proposed use of the ADMT and the consumer's rights so that the consumer can decide whether to opt out or to proceed and whether to access more information about the business's use of ADMT. Second, once the consumer has received the pre-use notice, they can choose to opt out of the business's proposed use of the ADMT or to proceed with it. If the consumer proceeded with the business's use of ADMT, the consumer can then make an access request for information about the business's use of ADMT with respect to the consumer. When the business receives a consumer's request for access, it must then provide certain information to help the consumer understand the decision that was made about them and how the business made the decision. Next slide, please. The pre-use notice, opt-out, and access right requirements apply when a business is using automated decision-making technology in one of the ways that's outlined on this slide. The first threshold focuses on the type of decision-making that can have the most significant impacts on consumers' lives, such as deciding whether to provide or deny employment opportunities. The second and third thresholds address contexts in which consumers are particularly vulnerable to the use of profiling and may be less able to avoid it, such as in their workplace, at school, or in publicly accessible places. The fourth threshold is one that the new rule subcommittee recommended. Including this threshold would enable consumers to opt out of profiling for behavioral advertising. To be clear, this opt-out would not be limited to cross-context behavioral advertising, which is defined by the statute. In addition, consumers known to be under 16 years of age, opt-in consent would be required for behavioral advertising. The fifth and sixth thresholds were previewed for the board in July. They focus on profiling consumers known to be under 16 and on training uses of ADMT. Note that if the board is interested in pursuing these two thresholds, staff would need to refine the language of these thresholds and framework accordingly. For example, to ensure consistency with the risk assessment framework and the requirements within proposed sections 7030 and 7031. Next slide, please. 
Turning now to the components of the proposed framework, starting with the pre-use notice requirements. Before a business can use ADMT with respect to a consumer, it would need to provide a pre-use notice to the consumer so that the consumer can decide whether to opt out or proceed and whether to access more information about the business's use of ADMT. To be clear, there is no exception to providing a pre-use notice. If the business met one of the thresholds discussed on the prior slide, it would need to provide a pre-use notice to the consumer. In drafting these requirements, we considered what information about the business's proposed use of ADMT would be most meaningful to a consumer at that stage when exercising their CCPA rights. Accordingly, the information would include the purpose for which the business proposes to use the automated decision-making technology, a description of the consumer's right to opt out and how they can exercise that right, a description of the consumer's right to access as well as how they can exercise that right. And then the business must also provide a simple and easy to use method for consumers to obtain additional information about its use of automated decision-making technology. This additional information would include explanations of the logic of the ADMT, including key parameters that affect the intended output, what the intended output of the ADMT actually would be, such as a score that it may generate, how the business would use that output, including the role of human involvement, and whether the ADMT has been evaluated for validity, reliability, and fairness, and the outcome of that evaluation. Next slide, please. Generally, if a business receives an opt-out request before it uses automated decision-making technology with respect to a consumer, it is not permitted to process that consumer's personal information using that ADMT. However, if a consumer does not initially opt out but decides to do so later, this slide explains that a business is required to cease processing that consumer's personal information using that ADMT and to notify relevant service providers, contractors, or other persons of the opt-out and to instruct them to comply. Next slide, please. The proposed framework also outlines certain instances where a business would not be required to provide consumers with the ability to opt out. With respect to these exceptions, the language in this slide is an abridged form of what is in the draft regulatory text in section 7030M. There's three things we'd like to highlight about these exceptions. First, these exceptions address instances where a business's use of ADMT is necessary to maintain the security of consumers' personal information for fraud prevention, for safety, or to provide a requested good or service. If the business has complied with Section 7002's requirements and assuming it has conducted a risk assessment and uses the personal information only for the purposes outlined on this slide, the business is not required to provide consumers with the ability to opt out. Now, with respect to the last exception on the slide, specifically when the use of ADMT is necessary to provide a requested good or service, please note that to rely on this exception, a business, uh, to rely on this exception first, the consumer must have specifically requested that good or service, and second, a business must demonstrate that it has no reasonable alternative method of processing other than the use of ADMT. The draft regulations outline how a business can demonstrate this and provides examples. Second, the reference to section 7002 here is to remind businesses that any use of personal information, including a use subject to an opt-out exception, must still comply with section 7002's requirements. Lastly, for profiling for behavioral advertising, none of these exceptions would apply. A business would be required to provide consumers with the ability to opt out without exception. Next slide, please. Turning to the access right requirements. If a consumer chooses to proceed with the business's use of automated decision-making technology, the business must provide consumers with access to information about how the business used that technology with respect to the consumer. In drafting these requirements, we considered what information would be most meaningful to a consumer in understanding how a business used ADMT with respect to them. That information includes the following, the purpose for which the business used ADMT with respect to the consumer, 
the output with respect to the consumer. So for example, if an ADMT generates scores for consumer, a business must notify the consumer of their specific score. Next, how a business actually used that output to make a decision with respect to the consumer, including what decision was actually made, what other factors besides the output impacted that decision, the role of human involvement, and whether the business's use of automated decision-making technology has been evaluated for validity, reliability, and fairness in the outcome of that evaluation. The business must also explain how the, how the ADMT worked with respect to the consumer, how it's, for instance, how its logic and key parameters affected the output and how they apply to the consumer. The business must also provide the range of possible outputs so that consumers can understand how they stack up relative to others. And lastly, the business must explain to a consumer how they can exercise their rights under the CCPA, such as the right to correct, as well as how the consumer can submit a complaint about the use of automated decision-making technology to the business or to the agency or California Attorney General. Next slide, please. This slide addresses exceptions to what information businesses must provide in their responses to consumers' access requests. To be clear, there is no exception to providing a response to a consumer's access request if the business meets the thresholds discussed on slide six. This slide merely highlights that where a business is using automated decision-making technology only for the purposes outlined on this slide and as set forth in section 7030M1 through three, the business would not be required to provide information that would compromise its processing for these purposes. Next slide, please. There are two topics in particular that we've identified for board discussion, which we'll turn to now. Next slide, please. The first topic is when pre-use notice, opt-out, and access right requirements should apply. This slide, which mirrors slide six, outlines the thresholds for these requirements. We flagged the latter three thresholds as options for board discussion, including in the draft regulatory text. Staff's recommendation is to retain all of these thresholds in the proposed framework at this stage, as we would appreciate the opportunity to receive public feedback on them. Next slide, please. The second topic is the exceptions to the opt-out right. This slide, which mirrors slide nine, sets forth the exceptions to the opt-out right. Again, staff's recommendation is to retain these exceptions at this stage, as we would appreciate receiving public comment on them as well. That concludes our overview of the proposed ADMT framework. Um, and I'll now turn it back over to our general counsel, Phil Laird, for next steps. Hi, and thanks again to the team. Um, yes, at this point, essentially, we would like to turn discussion back to the board. And I know we've already sort of started to toe into the waters here on, on some of this framework and, and these definitions. Um, but uh, uh, certainly, you know, feel free to start with the two topics um, identified, but obviously anything uh, anything within the draft proposal that uh, the board would wish to discuss, we are open to receive uh, comments and also answer any questions if we could be helpful. Uh, thank you, Mr. Laird. Mr. Wirtz, please go ahead. I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, Thank you for the presentation. That was very helpful. I had a couple questions. Um, if somebody opted out, is the business allowed to deny them access to their service? That's one question. The second one is as it relates to the under 16 um, additional option. I think it, you asked the question of us. I think all three of the additional options and those exceptions are, are fine to add in. I want to get to number four on the exceptions, but on additional options, is there any age at which the some parental approval is, is required for a decision being made? Um, you mentioned under 16, they have to, um, if they know they're under 16, that they can choose to opt in or out, correct? And if so, at what age would a parent have to be involved in that decision? That's the way I, I understood what you just said. And the final point on exception four, it's just I think you just gonna have to figure out the wording on this because it's it, it could be wide enough that you could drive uh, a lot of things through it. Um, so I just want I'd want to spend time, and I think, think that's part of the purpose of what you just described is we're gonna get this out and get some feedback and spend some more time with it. But those are my comments. 
Um, Mr. Wood, could I ask a quick clarifying question on your first question? When you say, can the business deny access to their um, goods or services? To the consumer, in yeah. In lieu of, of offering the, op the, offering the um, opt out, et cetera? Correct. Yeah, so you want this, so go find another business. If you, yeah, if you don't want us to be able to sell your info, then you can't be a customer of ours. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought yeah. you meant. Just want to be sure. Um, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Um, I'm happy to address your first two questions and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Anderson for the last question. So on the access to the service, um, the CCPA does prohibit discrimination when a consumer is exercising their CCPA rights. And so um, that would that should hopefully prevent a business. So for example, instance, if an employee wants to opt out of profiling, they shouldn't be discriminated against for opting out of profiling. Um, and then on the the last exception, the requested good or service exception, that is intended to address situations where a business could really not provide a good or service requested by the consumer without the use of ADMT. And that exception is meant to, you know, prevent the general use of op, um, a general use of ticket or leave it offers essentially that last exception is meant to address situations where a business really has no alternative except the use of ADMT. Otherwise, when a consumer opts out, they should be able to receive the service that they requested without um, being penalized. On the under 16 and when parental approval would be required, that is something that our current regulations already address. Generally, it's under 13, you need parental approval. And in the we would generally align with that framework if opt-in consent was included in this framework as well. So it's generally under 13, you need parental approval. 13 to 16 is when you would have the minor um, provide the consent. Great, thank you. And board member Worth, I was going to take your question about the exception and I just wanted to clarify, um, is your concern is about the, the last exception um, where there's a requested good or service and the business is um, trying to avail itself of the exception that it has no reasonable alternative method? Yeah, I mean, listen, I just, when I read them the first time, the first three are super clear, right? And the fourth is just, has, I just want to spend time with it and hear, get feedback on it to understand um, if it's, you know, we're not going to create a, an opening that we're not intending to have. That's all. I don't think there's anything to do about sure. it right now. Sure. So I can, if it's helpful, I can walk through some of the way that we constructed this. So with, with this particular exception, um, we drafted it to account for circumstances in which a business literally cannot provide the requested product or service without the use of ADMT. And we did take several steps drafting the exception to try to avoid potential abuses, including by making it a rebuttable presumption that a business does have a reasonable alternative method of processing if either the business or anyone in its industry or a similar industry um, is using or ever has used an alternative method to provide even a similar good or service. So it starts with a rebuttable presumption. Effectively, if you or anybody else like you has done it without ADMT, and then in order to rebut the presumption, the business would have to demonstrate one of the, the following three things. The futility of developing or using an alternative method of processing. Two, that the alternative method would not be as valid, reliable, and fair or three, that developing an alternative method would impose extreme hardship upon the business. And there's much more detail about each of those, including with some examples within the draft regulatory text. But um, those were three ways in which we were hoping to cabin abuses that might otherwise arise from businesses saying that they just cannot provide a good or service without the use of ADMT. And then finally, there's a requirement that the business that's relying upon such an exception document how they meet those requirements and be able to provide it to the agency within five business days of the agency's request. We're, of course, open to um, feedback on tightening those exceptions, and we think that we could get great public feedback on those points as well. Yeah, I think that would be fine. I, I did notice the five business days. That comes up pretty quick, Anya. If you're if you're operating a business and you're looking one direction and you get a letter in the mail that, you know, maybe someone's out two days later, they get to it. So I would just ask people to think about um, that time frame because I don't know that going to 10 business days is going to really make a big difference to us, but that's just my thought on that. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Other um, other comments, questions from the board? Um, Mr. McTaggart, thank you very much. And then, then Ms. De La Torre. Okay, so um, I have a couple of overarching comments. One is, um, so going back to the section we were just talking about, 
I, I'm a big fan of yes, including the behavioral advertising, including the under 16, you know, uh, and the training. So let's get feedback on that. So I think that's, I would include those. The two and three, um, so three, I have the same comment I had with um, with the risk assessment. I think we need to tighten up that profiling language because right now it's just basically you're using apps out in the wild. So I'd, I'd go with the European systematic monitoring kind of concept. And then two, uh, I, I have, I have, you know, uh, this is about the jobs and about employees. And I, many times when we were uh, in the election to get this um, passed, I, I would say the same thing that we all have a interest in knowing if the delivery driver is blowing through red lights or stop signs, including the delivery driver. Um, so there shouldn't be monitoring of employees that the employees are not aware of, but I'm very, I don't know where we're getting this for me anyway, I'm very uncomfortable with the notion that all of a sudden we're going to say in, in, in everybody does business in California, that your employees can opt out of essentially your HR and work process. So think about just truck drivers, right? There's, 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 there's software that monitors whether they've slept enough or they're driving too fast or, you know, did the pilots land the plane at the right part of the, you know, runway or, you know, are the, are the delivery drivers, uh, 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 you know, showing up on time? Are they, are they, are they running too fast? Are the call center people being rude and, you know, saying terrible things and uh, are bank tellers stealing or are, are bartenders stealing money? I mean, there are all sorts of processes that we've developed in the workplace to make sure that uh, we serve customers fairly, that, 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 you know, you can think about a world. I've always believed that one day we're going to extend this, the reach of this law to government agencies and uh, to nonprofits. This would allow, if you, if you ever did extend it to cops, the cop could say, Hey, I'm not going to get, don't, don't put that camera on me. I don't have to, I don't have to be monitored anymore. And um, you know, that ADM stuff that's going to go through all my millions of hours of cop video. No, we, we, we don't have to do that now because we can opt out. And so I'm very, I think that, I actually would strike this. I, I I don't agree that employees should be able to opt out of the uh, the, the business's software, whatever the, the workplace is, but they should absolutely know that it's going on. So that if you're on the work computer and you think it's, you know, you're not being monitored, no, actually it's your work computer we're monitoring you. And I think there's a lot of, you know, history about um, if it's a work device, it's the businesses, if it's your personal device, they and they should not, you know, I'm super committed to the fact that if they're, outside of work or on their own phone of course the the, the the business should not be monitoring them and that's like i find that offensive but equally i think we're going to break a lot of stuff if we all of a sudden say to every employee who you know works for a company that does business in california you no longer have to be subject to all the processes that are part of your job i just think it's a huge step to take and so i i'm, I'm not a fan of number two can i um respond to that before you move on mm -hmm. mr Tiger? Um, I think this is a really important point. I think it is complicated and um, that leads me to desire public input on it. Uh, Mr. McTaggart mentioned, for example, truck drivers. Professor Karen Levy has a paper or a series of papers that um, rely on her research with uh, long haul truck drivers and the intense surveillance that they undergo. And it's not clear that that in surveillance is well matched with things like safety and so forth. Um, but it is very difficult um, for the drivers. I see that as a bit of an analogy to um, our limited capacity to know exactly how these things will play out um, towards the outcomes that we desire and that our statute requires of us. I don't think that trucking companies are trying to make life miserable or undignified or in fact unsafe for truck drivers um, with this surveillance, but the result of some of the techniques that she studied was not as positive as you might think. Um, and I, you know, so I think that it's complicated. I also think that um, when I read this language, um, I certainly um, saw some of the questions you're raising, Mr. McTaggart. I also saw it a little bit through the lens of the pandemic. 
and the fact that home and work became very porous for a lot of people in a way that has not necessarily changed. Again, I think it's complicated. I think the line drawing um, is complicated. And I think the subcommittee had the staff have done a really good job sort of um, with an initial pass. And I would really like the opportunity to have more um, in-depth feedback conversations with staff, um, ultimately with an eye towards hearing um, from the public and from experts, um, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, so that's, um, I, I, um, I think these are really valuable questions. I would not be ready to make a decision without more input that we would get um, through other channels. Um, and I apologize, I think maybe Ms. Sheikh had, did you have something sort of technical to respond with and then Ms. De La Torre? Uh, yes, I just wanted to raise um, that this is an, a threshold, one to uh, Chair Urban's point, this is an area where staff identified particular vulnerabilities of employees. It is much harder to leave your workplace if you are being subject to intensive profiling than to just leave a website. Um, and so this was meant to address that specific vulnerability in the workplace. Uh, one thing that I also wanted to flag is that this is this would interact, and we foresee that this would interact with some of the exceptions built into the framework. And so, for instance, if you are profiling your employees as part of cybersecurity to make sure that they are respecting access controls and not trying to circumvent them, so long as you are complying with Section 7002 and have conducted a risk assessment and are only using that information for the purposes of the exception, you would not be required to provide an opt-out. Um, however, there are instances where profiling of employees is not simply for security, it's not simply for fraud prevention, and those are the instances that we are trying to get to. So, for instance, as part of a workplace wellness program, if you are tracking your employees' movements, they should have the ability to opt out. That would not meet one of the exceptions listed in the four um, under Section 7030M. Um, and those are the instances, again, where if you're an employee, you're particularly vulnerable and you should have the ability to say, I would not like to be subject to profiling and not be discriminated against for exercising that right to opt out. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Ms. Dilatory? Thank you. I, I wanted to stay on this topic of um, employees, independent contractors, job applicants, and students. I actually, I have her presentation from Professor Levy that um, Mrs. Urban referred to, and I, you know, th this is years ago, right? Like I don't know what's going on right now, but um, that's this this area of um, intrusive surveillance is is concerning, and it's concerning as it relates to employees, um, and I think that there is broad support within the board to create. Um, Optal rights around optal rights around um, intrusive surveillance. Um, I want to also be mindful of of the scope um, because we define ADMT to mean basically technology, and many, if not all, of the decisions that employers make on their employees uh, will use some type of profiling. Um, and I don't, don't see necessarily getting involved in decisions on promotions, decisions on um, hiring and firing that do not involve intrusive surveillance as part of the scope of the agency. I know that there are other state agencies that are working to ensure that those are fair and there is no, um, no, um, um, discrimination and I applaud those efforts. I just want to make sure that our agency is in, in the in the lane where I think we belong, which is more that intrusive surveillance space. So I will appreciate if, if staff walked us around um, you know how this really works for employees, also independent contractors. I think independent contractors takes it even one step farther. Uh, Mr. McTaggart made reference to you know some of the businesses that use extensively independent contractors. Um, to what degree should those independent contractors have an opt-out right from from the use of um, technology, basically? Um, and uh, students is another one that I was thinking about because obviously I teach, 
And uh, so, you know, the example that came to mind for me in terms of use of technology, I, I take role. I, I, you know, every day at the beginning of the class, I see who is there and who is not. I can do it on a paper or I can do it on Canvas, which is the system that my university uses. It's just more efficient to use technology to do that. And it, it, it will impact my decision on the grade um, in terms of who is present. And obviously I know, you know, the UC system is not within the scope of what we regulate. But my point, the point that I'm trying to make is that often technology is used simply because it's efficient. And if it's efficient and it's transparent and it's fair, I don't know that um, there, there needs to be an a, a, a opt out right around that. I, I'm uh, like Mr. Natagar, a little wary of going into, into that space. Um, so if we could maybe get some specific examples on how the staff is at this point, um, thinking about employees, independent contractors, job applicants and students, and not the intrusive surveillance, but just technology in general. How, what happens when technology is used to profile? And, and let's remember profile is defined to mean evaluating any aspects concerning the natural person's performance at work. So technology is gonna be used to evaluate performance at work, right? Um, I, I will appreciate that um, uh, input and, and feedback. Um, do you have, have you thought through specific examples where this will be triggered when there's no intrusive surveillance? Thank you, Ms. Otoy. Ms. Jay? Absolutely. So I think it's helpful um, that this is not about just any use of an employee's personal information. You would specifically have to be profiling them, which has a specific definition under the statute and that we would leverage under the regulations. Um, one thing that I'd like to flag in terms, I don't know if there necessarily should be a distinction between employees and independent contractors and job applicants. The statute doesn't make a distinction across these three categories in providing these individuals with privacy protections. And particularly because in a gig economy, a lot of individuals are functioning as independent contractors. Um, they should still uh, receive similar privacy protections, particularly if they are being subject to profiling. And then on the on examples, I think one example that could be helpful to, again, explain why job applicants, independent contractors, these individuals should be part of this framework. Um, so for instance, if you are applying for a job and you receive a job interview, if as part of the job interview, the uh, hirer wants to use some sort of emotion recognition technology to analyze your personality as part of the job interview process, you should be able to opt out of that type of intrusive profiling without having, without losing that job opportunity, without being discriminated against for exercising your opt-out right. Um, that's an example, you know, none of the exceptions would apply. That is the type of profiling that we've seen of job applicants that we think does warrant privacy protection. But, but I think that your example goes exactly to what I already said, like intrusive profiling. And I support that. Is there any example that doesn't involve intrusive profiling that you could relate to employees, independent contractors, applicants, or students, where they should have a right to opt out. That, that's kind of the example that I'm looking for. Um, I, I think it would be helpful to understand what you mean by intrusive profiling. We've given a lot of examples in the draft regulatory framework of the types of profiling that would be subject to the requirements. So for instance, keystroke trackers, productivity or attention monitors, video or audio recording, live streaming, facial or speech recognition, automated emotion assessment, location trackers, speed trackers, web browsing, mobile application, and social media monitoring tools. And so we think there are a lot of examples already provided in the draft framework to guide businesses on the types of profiling technologies we are thinking through. But if there are things that you think are missing or that are not appropriately addressed, we're happy to take that feedback. Right, but profiling is defined to mean any prediction concerning a natural person's performance at work, right? Like any prediction related to performance at work that is intermediated uh, through technology will become part of this framework, right? With the caveat that there might be an exception. And I think that one of the considerations for us is whether we tailor the right to our concern, which I absolutely agree on the on the intrusive 
profiling examples that have been shared. And we don't have intrusive profiling defined in the law, as you know, but we could, we could define it and then tailor a right around something that's more concrete. Um, it sounds to me like you don't have any particular example of a situation that will not be intrusive to share. Can I, can I just ask Ms. De La Torre, um to clarify your question? This is really helpful, thank you. Um, it's very okay. helpful. Um, would it be helpful to have examples that are sort of tailored to these different roles that people play? I can certainly imagine intrusive profiling that is specific to a student um, a student who is on a campus, for example, we know that some schools are now trying to keep track of students in order to have early interventions um, to be sure that they don't, you know, fall behind or um, fall out before they graduate. And I expect that people have positive associations with that, um, but also perhaps, you know, um, negative associations with that. So that would be one example of something that is um, in a general umbrella sense, could be seen as intrusive profiling. It's quite specific to a certain social context, and people may have different views on whether it should fall within um, this framework or not. Um, and so I would first be interested to see if that is the sort of thing you're thinking about. And then secondly, um, if that were um, something where and I always fear I'm going to like mess up with OAL, but if we were to have examples or or something like that, um, that would help. I would I would find it valuable again to sort of get public feedback um, uh, on 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 things that that let that people can sort of hold on to if that makes sense um, in terms of their own social context. Uh, that was really really helpful. I so the way I'm thinking about this is because this is a staff draft that is coming back to subcommittee. Is how do we as a subcommittee improve in the on the initial draft? And one of the things that I was thinking, I mean, and this is strategic, right? How do you get to where you want to go in terms of offering the right? And there's the possibility that I think staff has taken, which is to find a very broad right with a rather broad exception, or there's the possibility of tailor the right to the concern and then have a much narrower exception. And I see advantages and disadvantages to both. And that's why I've been thinking in terms of, you know, what, you know, if, if you were to tailor the right more to the concern and all of the examples that I could come up with will fall in this category of something that is not just the profiling that, that we're concerned about. It's just a specific kind of profiling. We're not necessarily concerned about the use of technology, uh, you know, to do a 360 review of an employee, that's not something that we necessarily, I mean, that logistically is more efficient and I don't, don't think it's, it's concerning. And one of the factors here to me as well is, is um, how do we communicate out to um, the public? I think that one of the successes of CCPA was to create a right around opt-out of self. The reason being is that cell has an intuitive meaning for people. And so if it's a right that's based on opt-out and it's named around something that's intuitive, I think it will increase the chances that people actually will exercise that right. Um, so tailoring a right to opt-out in the space of automated decision-making to something that's more precise, like intrusive automated decision-making, um, oh, sorry, intrusive profiling or a specific um, automated decision-making I think also will help communicate uh, to consumers the importance of exercising that right. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm hoping that that helps that you understand where I'm, I'm men mentally, right? Like, do, do, we, do we tailor the right to the actual concern? To, to me, in profiling, that's some form of intrusiveness in the profiling. And in automated decision making, is lack of transparency number one, and, and number two, um, lack of human intervention is something that is still people care a lot about. Um, and then maybe the exception in the back end can be narrower in, in, the, in the subcommittee version because we have tailored the right more clearly. Um, so that's, that's uh, where, my, where my mind is. And I literally couldn't come up with that example of profiling that will not be intrusive, that I would be necessarily 
concerned about, or I think the public will not be concerned about. So maybe the staff, you know, um, has that 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 kind of um, they have dedicated more time to it. So perhaps um, they had some examples that I was missing. Um, thanks so much, De La Torre. Um, I, I just wanted to check a little bit on um, process just so I understand. Um, my understanding um, of the draft is that um, the subcommittee has done a lot of work on it and has had a lot of input. Um, I just want to be sure that I'm understanding that correctly because it does um, indicate something about maybe where we want to go next with the draft. Right. So this is a staff draft. I think there was a little bit of um, a miscommunication when it went out. It should have come out with a staff draft at the beginning and be labeled that way. When we realized that it was not labeled, it was a little too late to relabel because of the processes that going to getting anything on our website that I understand now takes two weeks. So um, the, we, we expedited it because we wanted to make sure to you know, uh, help accelerate the process. But uh, we have not had a full opportunity to um, review it as the subcommittee. And I, my, my expectation is that it will come back to subcommittee so that in the next board meeting, we will present a subcommittee version of this, of this draft. Um, thanks, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Lay, I just, sorry, Mr. McTaggart, I know you're there. I just um, want to give Mr. Mokalay, a, Mr. Lay a chance. Yeah, so, you know, I think the, the idea was, you know, the, the subcommittee would see it one more time, but, you know, considering how much input the rest of the board has, you know, maybe, I, I, I'm just worried about timelines. Um, so, I, you know, I, I would be supportive of maybe just letting the, the subcommittee hold on to it for like two more weeks and then releasing it to staff or, um, yeah, just so we can get the final subcommittee version out. But, you know, happy to do whatever the, the full board decides if we want to get it out today for individual feedback or, or just let us hold on to it for a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would, I've seen there's a lot of input, so <laughs> maybe staff would be best addressed to, you know, uh, address the individual board members input. Um, thank you, Mr. Lay. I mean, I'm certainly um, hankering to have input, um, substantive input, even more than we could probably have in a conversation, um, in a public conversation. I really, I know I've said this a couple of times, and I wish I could come up with better words um, rather than just repeat, repeat it, but I really commend the subcommittee for this, you know, thoughtful, detailed work that absolutely, um, it, it's obvious that it draws upon um, expertise in the subcommittee um, and has been under development since the September of 2021. And I do think that the others on the board um, also are very invested in this um, and would and would like to um, provide um, feedback. Um, so I would I would prefer um, a shorter um, timeline to getting there, um, uh, particularly after the really thoughtful and robust discussion we've been having today, listening to other board members as well. Um, so anyway, I thank you both for the notes um, on what is happening and where it's going. And I'll ask, um, Mr. Laird, did you have a, a comment on that? And I'm so sorry, Mr. McTaggart, then you're next. Uh, yeah, apologies. I just wanted to make one clarification um, and that is, I. I would have to disagree that um, there wasn't an opportunity for the subcommittee to provide feedback. We actually had multiple rounds of discussions with the subcommittee on this draft. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that clear that um, we've been very engaged on, on this from a staff perspective. Thanks, Mr. Laird. All right, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, I think with respect to this employee thing, you know, if you can, if you look at the definition of profiling in ADM, this literally would cover, um, you know, a, a badge that badged you into work that said I was here. So when you're going to look at someone's attendance and you can say, were they there or not? I mean, this is the most basic kind of employee HR stuff this covers. And so I think, you know, to Ms. Delatore's point, which I think is a, a, a good framework, I'll give you two examples that, that, that we used. Um, that I think most people say that's kind of uh, that's kind of intrusive. So, if a if a 
business knows it's going to maybe be having some layoffs and starts to say, okay, which of our employees might be having medical problems that are going to be expensive so we can get them off of our insurance? We'll lay these people off. That's, that feels unrelated to work and super intrusive, right? Or let's say there's a unionization drive and the business is like, let's make sure that we track down the employees that we think are going around to different, you know, other employees' houses after work to do like a card check situation. Well, let's fire those guys. Again, super intrusive. But my point with most of this stuff at work is this is just work. You know, if if I'm in a big call center and there's software saying, oh, you're taking two calls a, a, an hour and this guy's taking 27 calls an hour and the average is 27. I don't, why, why should we all of a sudden start saying, okay, people get to opt out of this, this, uh, this is not what we're, 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 pri we're a privacy uh, agency. And we're not, I don't think an HR agency coming around to say uh, that all the processes that business has uh, developed and, and it, you know, maybe, maybe there's a, a paper out there saying that the truck drivers are surveilled too much, but at the same time, I'm pretty happy that the truck driver, some alarm goes off if, the, if he's, if he or she is driving, you know, too many hours or, as a consumer drives on the roads. And, and I and, and I think that 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 safety aspect goes forever. And I don't think that the um the the exceptions in M3 or M do it. Uh so uh I I I'm I feel like I'd love to get some more feedback from staff if they could come back and maybe think about it from a one way to think about it is this in a reasonable expectation of a of a of an employee that, that they would be monitored this way. Sort of, we have reasonable expectations somewhere else. You know, it's it's reasonable to me to think that if I'm on a work computer, that the work's going to be monitoring my computer. You know, and so versus totally unreasonable, unexpected, unknown. So that might be one 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 way of looking at it. But I, I think we're we're opening a huge can of worms if we leave this language as it is. Thank you, uh, Mr. McTaggart. Sorry, because I found the, the truck driving research interesting. The surveillance was in no small part to get them to go faster and to like rest less. So, um, but um, I was wondering, Mr. McTaggart, about your thoughts on the legal or similarly significant effects as a threshold um, for this. Um, you know, I'm thinking of your call center employee who's not um, answering calls. Um, and <laughs> I, I said, I mentioned my, my, my sort of general concerns with that approach, but are you thinking that a threshold that um, would try to capture um, the things that um, essentially to be very, very um, uh, un not detailed, but uh, the things we care about and the things we don't care about, um, separate those out a little bit more. Is that sort of what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, I like the, the, the with the caveat that uh, Mr. Latore made about the employment or independent contracting within the decisions that produce legal consequences. I think because I do think we have a huge problem with the gig economy on that one. But in general, I think that's a that's a that's a good threshold. And I don't mind the notion of I actually find it offensive if you're going to try and find out who's pregnant so you can fire them in in, in, in before the you know before they get pregnant because of the child care costs or they're going to take it, you know, a, a, a leave. That's the kind of stuff. And I do think that would be covered by some form of like reasonable expectation. Um so so I like the threshold of the legal or similarly significant effects if it's a little bit amended. I like the if it's massive surveillance in a public area. I, I like the, I, I'm a big huge fan of the behavioral advertising. It's just this one at work I think is has got me really um, pausing because I think we are going down a road that has severe consequences. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, I my ears are open for further comments. My eyes are also on the clock, and um, my thoughts are on the understanding that people might be hungry. Um, but I wanted to check in to see where um, the board um, thinks the conversation might be. I'm still in favor of um, um, an approach where um, we take this good work. We do something like the risk assessments, um, uh, board members like Mr. McTaggart, who has, has a lot of, sort of detailed um, thinking, um, could offer this um, one way to staff and um, they staff could come back um, to the board with more detail 
hopefully being able to get, again, like more outside information um, uh, on a relatively, like relatively soon from economists and, and stakeholders. So that's sort of where I still am. Um, I'm also happy because I know we haven't talked about all the aspects of the ADMT um, draft. Um, so there may be more, um, more to talk about. Um, Ms. De La Torre and then Mr. McTaggart. Um, let's let Mr. McTaggart uh, go first. And my question was on the logistics and you answered it. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, well, uh, Chairman, do you, uh, I have sort of two more kind of areas I, I was going to talk about, but if you'd like to, it's up to you. I wasn't too sure whether they want to take a break or not, but I, I, they're not, I can just kind of mention what they are if you'd like. Um, I'm good, but I am aware that I everybody has biology. So, um, uh, Mr. Worth it was nodding. So, Mr. L and staff are, are are we okay to continue the conversation? Okay, great. Please go okay, ahead. So, okay, then my next uh, section is in M. The exceptions, the the you know, and it's I think appropriate to say you don't have to allow the consumer the right to opt out if it's to provide a good or service that they're specifically requesting. But then the whole uh, rubric below that in order to take advantage of that. So, you know, Mr. Worth's asking for a car. I'm getting him the car there. I need to use my ADM to get him the car. Uh, he wants to opt out of it. And I'm like, you can't opt out. I can't get you the car if you opt out of the service. But now to do that, I have to demonstrate all these things that there's no other reasonable alternative. And I, I, I struggle to figure out what that's doing for us for privacy. They have a system, Amazon gets you your package and it, assigns the driver somehow and it's all ADM and at some point your package shows up in the middle of the night or it shows up the next morning and it's up to them and I want to opt out of that they then have to go through this whole thing saying that no one else there's no other service that can work uh there's no reasonable alternative they have to show you why there's no reasonable alternative now think of your small business you're buying again on software that does whatever it it it, it turns on your utilities or it saves utilities you install this someone says, you know, they want to opt your tent, wants to opt out or something like that. You have to demonstrate that there's been no other system out there. You just bought a, a package of software. So I, this whole set of kind of qualifiers for the exception of providing the good of service specifically requested by the consumer, I, it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and it's a ton of uh, work to demonstrate why the business, which has, because there's this presumption here that automated decision-making is terrible. Like you, when you look at this, it, it, there's this presumption, if you read this, that it's a bad thing. And I think it's a bad, it's a tool or weapon, right? It's, it's, a, bad, it's, a, it, it's a bad thing depending on how it's used, not necessarily a bad thing. And this, I found the whole 4A through E um, on page 10 and 11, just to be very um, focused on sort of a business having to justify why it wasn't letting the consumer opt out. And much of this is going to be like, hey, we, it doesn't work. Our, our thing just doesn't work if, if you want to opt out of this. Um, and so I think that's this is problematic. Um, and I'll stop there. I have one more thing after this, but I'll stop okay. there for now. And thanks, Mr. McTaggart. So there's the substantive problematicness um, of the example, which is really helpful. And then there's the question of process around that. Um, and so um, I'm wondering if the sort of list of affirmative requirements um, weren't there for some, I don't know, set of examples or some sort of defined things, that would be um, more, um, that would be less problematic from your point of view. I'm just trying to think, I'm, I, I, I hear, I hear what you're trying to think in like how the, excuse me, how the framework might be set up and Mr. Worth pointed out that another option or another outcome would be a big hole um, uh, that we didn't intend um, in the regulations as well. I guess for me, if if, if I'm asking for the, the good, I want the thing delivered to my house. I want the car to come to my street corner. I, I want the food uh, to be delivered. Uh, I want to get the rec recommendation for the restaurant. That feels very different. It's it, again, that goes back to the, even in the, in 121 in the, in the actual statute, the, the, with respect to the process, you can say don't process my sensitive personal information, but you can't say it if it's necessary to deliver the good that you're requesting. And we, back in the statute, we just tie it to the reasonable expectations of a consumer. 
And I don't know why we wouldn't do that here. Um, and uh, because this, you know, to demonstrate that there's, it's futile to use an alternative method of processing, just think about what we're asking a business to do. And I don't know how that gets us any closer to privacy. Uh, it's a lot of work for the business, but I don't think it advances the cause of privacy. Um, what you want to make sure is they're not using an excuse to say, oh, well, we really need to surveil you 24 seven in order to tell you what news you want to see. Well, that's, that's, that, that's not right. So you want to make sure that the, um, this exception is, is in fact uh, necessary to provide you the good or service, but we could, that you just say it has to be necessary and you have to be able to show that it's necessary if you, if we ask you. So that's a, that is the framework, the process of the framework as to sort of what you have to do as a default affirmatively. Um, that, that was um, what I was hoping to understand. I, I think I understand um, the, the thought now, Mr. McTaggart. Um, uh, Ms. Sheikh, did you have a response just to that? I, Ms. De La Torre is, is in the queue. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and this is actually quite simple. My, my feedback is that this is the exact line that staff has been trying to navigate which is how to prevent abuse of this exception and ensure that surveillance and profiling is not simply happening just because it can, um, but that it is in fact necessary to provide the requested good or service. And so this is one where we would particularly appreciate, you know, having feedback like this from board individual board members to understand how we can find that right line. Um, you know, the subcommittee has gotten the chance to give us feedback on the factors that are currently in the proposed framework. But again, given board members, board member McTaggart's feedback, I think it would be helpful to also get individual feedback from board members as well. Thank you. Ms. I'll second that. Ms. Alatore? Oh, sorry, Ms. Anderson. I believe you said I'll second that for the exactly. record. Ms. De La Torre. Um, So a, a couple of things here. Um, number one, um, this um, carve out um, is to provide the good or perform the service specifically requested by the consumer, which to me reads as not applicable in the context that we mentioned before of employees, independent contractors, jobs, applicants, and students because they don't request services. So it doesn't completely address, I mean, to, in, in my view, it doesn't really address the concerns around that broad opt out right in, in, in those contexts. And again, I just want to highlight, I do support a right for um, employees, contractors, job applicants to opt out of intrusive surveillance um, or intrusive profiling. Um, and then the, the second thing is that it fundamentally, what it fundamentally does, this approach, um, and that's why I want to rethink it, what it fundamentally does is it reverses the burden of the proof. If you are using technology under this framework, which the definition of ADNT is using technology to make a decision, and it's not that the technology is the only decision maker, but you aid in your decision or to profile, you actually have to prove that that's, that's not um, detrimental. And I think that in most cases, the use of technology is just efficient. It's not detrimental, it's efficient. And so to me, there's a distinctive advantage of crafting the rights, tailoring the rights around our specific concerns. It's, there's an advantage in terms of communicating out to the public so that they understand what we really are talking about and they take the steps that they need to take to opt out because this is still an opt out framework. Um, and, and then there is an advantage in terms of lowering the cost of compliance because you as an organization you're going to have to go through this analysis to make sure that you don't run afoul of the rules and that has a cost and and i was talking with uh, mr uh, lay on these and i i'm not sure you know i'm the only one here that's an immigrant so i'm not sure that i represent the perspective of Californians as well as others, including the staff that you know, might be um, raised here. But to me, this is this is the um, the piece of the rules that is a little um, you know based on your conceptualization of what individuals should have as rights. Granting rights on individuals is not going to necessarily resolve for the fairness of the system. To me, 
the risk assessment is a better tool to resolve for the fairness of the system. Granting, granting rights on, the, on individuals is about whether we think this particular person should have a right or not. And it does, can, you know, it, it can have a benefit for, for society. I do support people having a right to of doubt of intrusive um, surveillance. I do support people having a right to human intervention. I think these things are really, really important and should be clearly called out in our, in our um, framework. To me, in a way that's more easily accessible than, than, than the, the initial draft that the staff has provided. But at the same time, I don't know that I support the idea of just opting out of technology because it does have a cost. And I don't see the benefit, I don't see the privacy benefit to it. Um, so to me, you know, in a way you could compare this to another part of US culture and I'm a citizen now, so I should consider myself included, but this is one that is difficult for me to kind of wrap my mind around it, where, though I have been living here for 20 years, just the right to wear arms. This country has this attachment to the idea that individuals have to have a right to wear arms, that as a society we cannot break through, even though we know that as a society there is a cost for, for everybody. So maybe you know, there's more support in California for strong individual rights that have a cost for society than that I will, I will you know, I will have as, as somebody who grew up in, 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 I think, a region where public interest is, is something that is still very much considered and not so much individual rights. So, um, to, to put my idea, my ideas in a nutshell is I, I will prefer to draft opt out rights around concerns that are clear and have a smaller exception on the back end. I think it gives us more control on what we are granting the rights as opposed to this system where actually the businesses have the control after they read the exception. Even though I know the staff has done a lot of thinking around how to make sure that this is not a humongous, you know, carve out that um, organizations can use to deny rights. Um, but we will have more control if we actually define it in the front end. And also, I think it will be a better experience for, for, for consumers because you want to, you know, you, you want to um, be able to communicate this out. Um, one of the missing opportunities to me in this framework is that we don't name the rights. All of our rights in CCPA have a name that we choose and then we ask um, businesses to use, right? Like, I have a right to opt out of a sale. That has a meaning. Uh, I would love this to be set up, or I, I think there will be a benefit in, in setting this up as I have a right to opt out of legal or similar significant decisions that are um, AD and that are, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I'm, you know, it's after 12 and we're all hungry and I'm not, <laughs> um, that, um, uh, am I struggling to just Ms. find Taylor, the, the correct words? Yeah, Ms. Taylor, if you're hungry, everybody's hungry. Um, <laughs> is this what you're thinking? That I want to, another approach would be to narrow the rights, but also narrow the exemption. Exactly. And name all the rights. Exactly. Right. And, and so if we name the right, if we say this is your right to opt out of intrusive profiling, and we call it intrusive profiling, then industry will have to say, hey, you have a right to opt out of something that's named intrusive profiling. That has an intuitive meaning to the consumer immediately. If we do not set the name of the right, there's, first of all, you know, different organizations are going to use different names, which is going to be cons confusing to the consumer. But second, I think we're missing that opportunity to kind of push for compliance because the label has a meaning and organizations will choose to stop activities so that they don't have to use a label that they don't find beneficial for their brand. Um, so that's, that's the other uh, major um improvement that I would like to bring back as part of a subcommittee draft of um, these ADMT rules. Thank you. Um, Ms. Jake? 
Um, yes, thank you for the feedback, board member De La Torre. One thing that I would like to flag is that when we use words like intrusive um, or even the word surveillance, neither of those terms are defined by the statute. And I do think those are quite hard terms to define um, as and meet the APA clarity standard. And so that's just something for the board to keep in mind, which is defining a word like intrusive is actually going to be quite difficult. Um, and it's going to involve the same type of line drawing that we have with the thresholds and the exceptions. And so I just wanted to flag that we can't use words like that without also defining them. Um, and so we might end up in a very similar place, which is, again, what's in, what's out and how to scope it. Um, but, uh, you know, we're happy, to, of course, to take that feedback. And if the board feels very strongly about going in that direction, we would need a clear direction of how to define these types of terms from the full board. Um, thanks so much, um, Ms. Ms. Sheikh. Um, so I really value what Ms. De La Torre just said and the sort of the thinking about the, the framework um, I find really helpful. Um, I remain of the view that in terms of process, this is this is complex, it's nuanced, there are a lot of trade-offs, there's a lot of really good, um, thoughtful, detailed, deep work in the drafts that we have, and I think that we've aired um, those drafts well here. So I would like to um, suggest a, a motion, again, that is similar to the risk assessments, um, and then uh, Mr. McTaggart um, could have uh, discussions with staff. Um, I could, um, Mr. Worth could, Ms. De La Torre could, um, Mr. Lay could, and then staff would bring back to us with, a, you know, with some, with explanation sort of where collectively we are um, at that point. So that's what I would like to do. Um, uh, Mr. McTaggart, before, um, before we break for lunch, and I'm also wondering how people are feeling about um, taking public comment um, be before lunch. I would, I'm sure everybody's hungry, including the public, um, but I'd like to give people a chance to respond because we've been thinking about this for um, several hours now. Uh, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that approach of, of defining things. I do think you're somewhat you have to define, and I keep on saying I would, I would tie it to reasonable expectations. Um, but I do wanna also in public, just before we sort of, because it feels like you're about to make a motion here, before we close off, I also do wanna in public bring up, so the third area that I wanted to have the staff really take a look at is this notion of if the business has made a decision that um, results in the denial of goods or services. And so this is in 70, uh, this is in, uh, 7031 and uh, D talks about what happens if the business um, makes a decision that results in denial. Um, and it's with respect to B1. What worries me a little bit is, are we going to create a world? Cause then now the business has to get back to you. It has to tell you why, why, it, what, why it made what the decision um, and uh, I just I want to make sure we're not causing businesses to hold on to a lot of information in order to get back to you in case you ask. You know, it, it felt like we were this could end up being something that was bad for privacy. You, you applied for a job, you threw your resume into the whatever the online service, you didn't hear back. But now I don't know how that works. Every time they they have ten thousand resumes, they pick for whatever. Do they have to send back nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine? You didn't get the job here, and those people get to now ask why and. I, you know, so I just want to be, I don't have a good answer right now. Um, cause obviously people's jobs, you know, we don't, we want to make sure that businesses isn't discriminating, you know, terribly against one, one particular protected class, but it also felt like this, uh, would create a ton of opportunity for business or requirement. Now businesses have to hold on to stuff they wouldn't normally hold on to. So I, I'm a little, a little nervous about that one. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I think that's a great question. Um, um, and something for, um, I, I think there's a lot of nuance here. Um, obviously, as members of the board, we have a lot of um, thoughts and feedback, um, uh, and and thus I um, I remain where um, I have been on the process. Um, everybody, stop me uh, before I call for public comment. While I um, uh, say um, again the motions that we're going to put on the table, just so everybody's aware, 
One is to direct staff to advance the proposed cybersecurity regulations to formal rulemaking and authorize staff to make any of the necessary changes. Um, Ms. Schick pointed out improved readability, clarity, et cetera. Um, the second would be um, to um, uh, have staff um, uh, take back the uh, information that uh, they got today on the draft risk assessment um, uh, proposed regulations um, and receive uh, feedback on the draft risk assessment regulations from board members, um, taking care to incorporate um, changes um, from the board during this meeting. And then the third one would be um, a very similar motion related to the automated decision-making um, regulations, which would um, be to a motion to um, direct staff to um, take into account today's um, a conversation uh, in this public meeting and receive feedback on the draft from individual board members proposing a revised draft um, at, an, at a future meeting. I realize, and I know Mr. Lay had a second idea, which was um, like a time period um, before it goes in into staff's hands. I wanted to acknowledge that as well. Yeah, I think it's fine. I, I mean, I get the, the you know, I, I quite enjoyed working with Mr. Latore and staff has been great in the subcommittee process, but, you know, seeing how much feedback um, you all have, I don't know if it's best for the subcommittee to be the one that's, you know, translating all of that into the next draft. Um, so I think it's fine I, for, for the motion as, as you've described it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, with that, um, I would love to hear, we would all love to hear, I'm sure from members of the pub, from, of the public, it, are there public comments on this agenda item? If so, I'd like to remind you to use the raise your hand function if you are participating via the Zoom webinar and to press star nine, please correct me, Ms. Allen, if I got that wrong, if you have called in um, in order for Ms. Allen, our moderator, to call on you. And uh, a final reminder that you are um, uh, limited to three minutes. Thanks very much. Okay, great. Yes, this is for uh, agenda item one, which would be two A, two B, and two C: cybersecurity regulations, risk assessment regulations, and automated decision-making technology regulations. Um, if you would like to make a comment, raise your hand. Of course, if you're on the phone, by pressing star nine, um, and I will I will call on you. We're going to take. Uh, we have um, several hands raised, so we will take these uh, public comments in turn. Um, and we will start with um, Edwin Lombard. So I'm going to unmute you at this time, and you will have uh, three minutes to make your to make your comment. Okay, Edwin, you have been unmuted. Please go ahead. Well, can you hear me now? Okay, my name is Edwin Lombard. I came today to uh, listen and see for myself. If the agency is applying lessons learned from developing the last round of regulations, unfortunately, I'm here. I'm hearing more of the same. We are requesting that the agency publish the timeline after this meeting so small businesses know what to expect and how quickly the agency intends to move. As a representative of small business owners who, who re rely on technology, including automated decision making technology, to remain competitive and better serve our communities, we feel compelled to make this board aware of the importance of ensuring small businesses are not adversely impacted by these new regulations. Governor Newsom and the legislature have been thorough and thoughtful around guidance for AI and AM, ADMT, while this agency charges forward without the transparency process uh, uh, or robust engagement with small businesses that will be impacted by these regulations. The agency has a longstanding pattern of ignoring the concerns of small businesses. I strongly encourage collaboration through ongoing dialogue between the agency and businesses of all sizes to develop effective rules that work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lombard. Ms. Allen? Yes, thank you. Okay, we are uh, going to ask uh, Alex Torres. I am going to unmute you at this time. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. Um, are you there, yeah, Alex? You, yes, can great. you hear me? Yes, great, go ahead. 
Excellent. Thank you. Members of the board, Alex Torres here with Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek. On behalf of the Bay Area Council, we represent 320 of the nine county Bay Area's largest employers. Um, you know, picking up uh, on some points that Mr. Lombard expressed, I am I am encouraged by the conversation here today. Chair Urban, Mr. McTaggart expressing uh, some concerns around some of the scope of this. I think that's kind of where uh, some of our concerns come in. We want to make sure that we encourage adoption, but also make sure it's realistic with feedback from these businesses. I was encouraged, Chair Urban, by your notes to hear from the business community. And I think we really welcome the opportunity to engage in this in a meaningful way. So look forward to the conversations to come. I mentioned one of our primary concerns center around the scope of, of the draft risk assessment regulations. Uh, we feel the scope is, is far beyond that of other state privacy laws and uh, beyond the bounds of the under California privacy law as well. Um, Mr. Torres, did you drop out or I think I think Mr. Torres comment may still have been going on. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Torres, we cannot hear you. Let me try. Uh, let me try to. Oh, there you are. The definitions of AI and automated decision making are so overly broad that they could effectively uh, encompass all automated uh, technology as written, even simple algorithms. I think believe that was something that was discussed. Uh, in addition, the detailed requirements in the section are, are not, not appropriate to a privacy law and go far beyond the mandate of the CPRA. Uh, the CPPA differs from other state privacy laws in ways that we believe will be counterproductive to California consumers. Uh, lastly, the regulations prescribe an inappropriate role of the business's board of directors in requiring the submission of the risk assessment to the board of directors for approval or requiring its certification of the risk assessment. Uh, we believe this requirement should be eliminated. This regulation, if retained, should uh, preferably require presentation to an employee with responsibility in this area. Uh, certainly, the level of involvement should be as determined by the business. The business can assess whether the full board or an appropriate committee of the board is warranted, just to call out a couple specific concerns. But again, encouraged by the conversation and the call to uh, engage with economists, engage with industry to figure out the specifics of what's workable and look forward to the conversations to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Ms. Allen? Yes, we are going to go to uh, Grace Getty. Um, Grace, I'm going to unmute you at this time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. There you, go. you have three minutes. You may begin. Wonderful. I'm Grace Getty. I'm with Consumer Reports, where I work on artificial intelligence policy in the consumer interest. I want to thank the board for their work on these draft rules. My comments will focus on the automated decision-making technology draft rules. I'm going to start off with a couple of things we really liked and then mention a few areas we'd like to see strengthened. So first, the definition of automated technology, automated decision-making technology. We appreciate that this is a broad definition and is not confined to technologies that make, quote, solely automated decisions about individuals. These tools can be risky even if human reviewers are empowered to intervene. Second, we appreciate that these rules require businesses to wait at least a year after a consumer opts out before putting the question to them again. Rights aren't useful in practice if businesses can wear consumers down with frequent requests. And third, we appreciate that the board moved to protect consumer privacy in public spaces. We have questions about how to make these rights usable for consumers in practice, but we think setting up a process for opting out of profiling technology in publicly accessible spaces is super important. On to some things we'd like to see tweaked or strengthened, um, we'd urge the board to cl consider clarifying the explanation a consumer can get if they are denied a good or service. We'd flag the CFPB's recent clarifications around what counts as a, quote, specific and accurate explanation when someone is denied credit under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, including when complex or AI tools are used. We'd also urge the board to consider clarifying that if a business can't produce a sufficiently specific or accurate explanation for why an ADMT denied someone a service, that tool cannot be used. Um, we think consumers shouldn't be subject to unexplainable decisions. Um, and then lastly, there's an addition we'd like to see to the pre-use notice. We think there should be a prominent, succinct, and plain language explanation for what the process looks like if someone does opt out of an ADMT including how the good or service will be provided without the ADMT. You know, anyone facing the decision of whether or not to opt out of a resume screening tool or an exam proctoring software will probably want to know 
what happens if they do. Um, that's it for me. Thank you so much to the board for these rules. We know they take a lot of work. Thank you, Grace Getty. Ms. Allen? Great, we are going to turn to Vanessa Chavez. Vanessa Chavez, I'm going to unmute you and you have three minutes to um, complete your comment. Vanessa, are you here? Thank you, Chair Urban and members. Vanessa Chavez with the California Association of Realtors. We're continuing to review the initial draft and as the language continues to evolve, we may have input or concerns regarding any housing related aspects of the proposed regulation. We thank the agency for its work on this and other matters, and we look forward to being a constructive participant in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa Chavez. Ms. Allen, do we have further public comment? Yes, we do. Um, Peter Leroy Munoz, um, I'm going to unmute you. You will have three minutes to start to give your public comment. You may proceed when you are ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm speaking on behalf of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, a business association representing more than 300 innovation economy companies. We echo the comments shared by previous speaker Alex Torres, representing the Bay Area Council. My comments address additional industry concerns. Disclosure of risk assessments and other submissions to the agency would result in the disclosure of confidential and proprietary information. The regulations do not include any protections from public disclosure, nor do they note that all applicable legal privileges are retained, a protection that is available under other state privacy laws. These requirements should be eliminated or the proper uh, protections added to the regulations to protect them from state FOIA requests and other disclosures and for privileges to be retained. Regarding automated decision-making, consumer opt-out for data used to train AI models is contemplated by the regulations. However, by allowing consumers to opt out of having their data used for training, the models we, we produce or, or will be produced will actually become worse as a result, hurting consumers by reducing the potential for innovation built on more complete data and increasing the risk of bias. Further, removing this opt out would not affect the privacy of any consumer because the data would be used generically in the AI modeling which relies on trends and patterns in data overall, not on a particular individual's data. Regarding cybersecurity audits, the draft regulations create extensive requirements for conducting cybersecurity audits that would conflict with generally accepted standards. The proposed requirements will create a burdensome and different cyber regime in California that is inconsistent with the White House's national cybersecurity strategy. Further, some of the proposed requirements go beyond the scope of the statutory authority and are not within the agency's jurisdiction. For example, the definition of cybersecurity incident requires disclosure, disclosure of an event that only potentially jeopardizes a business's system. This is an overly burdensome and vague requirement that will be confusing to comply with and difficult to enforce. Further, the definition's inclusion of business's information system- Peter Leroy, you have 15 seconds left, just so you know. Thank you so much. Seconds expands the regulations outside the statute's authority that is limited to systems that process personal information. The federal government is making significant strides to harmonize cybersecurity requirements. California should look to generally accepted frameworks like the NIST cybersecurity framework as Thank a foundation so for, for regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Leroy Munoz. Um, Ms. Allen? Yes, well, we will have Suzanne Bernstein at this time. I'm gonna unmute you, you will have three minutes. You can begin now. Hello, my name is Suzanne Bernstein and I'm a fellow with the Electronic Privacy Information Center, also known as EPIC. We're an independent research and advocacy center focused on protecting privacy in the digital age. Throughout the rulemaking process, EPIC has submitted several comments and provided testimony. EPIC commends the CPPA's work to protect the privacy of Californians and we are encouraged to see the agency's work to limit harms from ADMT technology. Today, I'll address three points. The ADMT notice and opt-out requirements, behavioral advertising, and general clarity. First, EPIC commends the draft regulations proposed notice requirements to provide consumers with much needed information about the use of ADMT technology in plain language. We support the opt-out requirements that would provide consumers with the ability to opt out of many uses of ADMT, including high impact decisions, profiling of employees and students, profiling in public places, and profiling for the purposes of behavioral advertising. 
without this kind of regulatory action, consumers are consumers are continually subjected to these ADMT systems that make decisions that may affect their livelihood, often without their knowledge. Second, Epic supports a default prohibition on profiling minors for behavioral advertising. Minors are uniquely vulnerable to the harms associated with the behavioral advertising system and the default to protect minors from this harmful profiling. We support the opt-out requirement for behavioral advertising for all consumers. We also encourage the agency to ensure the availability of a user-friendly universal opt-out mechanism so that consumers would not need to exercise the behavioral advertising opt-out for each business. This would be tedious and fatiguing and would ultimately undermine consumers' efforts to be removed from, from behavioral advertising systems writ large. We strongly support the agency's continued discussion about providing consumers with a full opt-out for all behavioral advertising, and we are happy to provide further materials related to this topic. Finally, we appreciate the clear disclosure requirements provided in this round of draft regula regulations, including the obligation for a business to disclose the purpose for which it will use any ADMT. For too long, businesses have used generic purpose language like, quote, improving our services, end quote, as carte blanche for ADMT use. In conclusion, EPIC supports the work of the agency to regulate harmful ADMT uses to protect the privacy of Californians. Thank you for the opportunity to share our comments. Thank you, Suzanne Bernstein. Bernstein, excuse me. Um, Ms. Allen? Um, yes, next up we have Matt Schwartz. Matt, I'm going to unmute you and you will have three minutes. You may begin now. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Schwartz, Policy Analyst at Consumer Reports, and I'll be discussing the draft rule and risk assessments. Uh, thank you to the board for the opportunity to comment and for all the hard work on these draft rules. Uh, Consumer Reports applauds the agency for drafting what would likely represent the strongest risk assessment requirements tethered to a comprehensive privacy law in the country. We appreciate that the current draft rules apply broadly to businesses undertaking a variety of risky processing activities and that they'll require businesses to commence a thorough accounting of their data collection and processing activities. Moreover, we appreciate that the current rules will require businesses to share their findings in a manner that will be both useful to consumers who seek to understand more about a business's practices, as well as regulators who want to take a closer look under the hood. We do have some suggestions for how the rules could be strengthened to further the consumer interest. First, we believe that Businesses should be required to share in the risk assessment when they're processing sensitive personal information for the purposes of making inferences about consumers. Under the law and existing regulations, certain protections around sensitive data, including the requirement for businesses to allow consumers to limit the use of their sensitive information, only apply to the extent to which businesses are using that information to infer characteristics about consumers. Consumers deserve to know when businesses are processing their data in this manner, and such a disclosure will help regulators and businesses grapple with the enhanced stakes that come along with making inferences from sensitive data. Additionally, in our view, the current regulations allow businesses to provide less than optimal clarity on this point, so we believe that businesses' assertion of their use of inferences should be provided in an abridged version of the risk assessment. Second, we believe that every business covered by these requirements should review and update their risk assessment annually rather than every three years, as is one of the options currently under consideration. We recognize that the rules otherwise state that businesses must update their risk assessments whenever there's a material change to processing activities. Um, we believe that requiring an annual review will likely inspire better risk, man, uh, risk assessment hygiene and give consumers a higher degree of confidence that current business practices have been accounted for in the risk assessment. Finally, we believe that the agency should require businesses to publish a publicly available version of the risk assessment. Currently, the draft rules seem to only contemplate an optional publishing of an unabridged uh, risk assessment, whereas we'd argue that at a minimum, businesses should be required to share an abridged version of the risk assessment that's updated with the same level of regularity as the unabridged version. You have version. 15 seconds left, 15 seconds remaining. Uh, and of course, if businesses want to provide an unabridged version, they may do that as well. So thank you for the time and happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you, Matt Schwartz. All right, next up we have uh, Jiwon Serrato. Jiwon, I'm going to unmute you and you will have three minutes. You may begin now. 
Thanks very much. Um, I'm Joanne Kim Serrato, partner in the San Francisco office of Baker Hosteller. I appreciated the discussion regarding harmonization and I had a question for uh, clarification. Um, I thought we heard during the discussion on risk assessment requirements that GDPR does not govern and specifically does not require a DPIA for employee data. Uh, this comment was made quite briefly, and I would like to make sure that this comment was heard accurately and, and considered by the board. Uh, we understand that GDPR does govern employee data, and a DPIA requirement under GDPR should include the collection and processing of employee data. So I would like a clarification at future meetings whether the board has considered that a risk assessment under GDPR would cover employee data. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Juan Kim Serrato. All right, next up, we, we have uh, Rocio uh, Baez. Rocio, I'm going to unmute you. You have uh, three minutes. You may begin now. Hello, uh, my name is Rocio Baez. I am a mom, a consultant, a business owner. I was born in California about 30 something years ago. Um, I'm also a privacy advocate. Um, I feel that my background uh, provides me a uh, perspective that allows um, me to see um, the implications of the proposed uh, rules here. Um, so so I, I first want to emphasize that um, everyone that is in this call, um, I feel that this is a very his historical time. I commend each and every one of you for um, for the the hours and hours of work that I, I know goes in to putting this forth and 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 seeing this come to fruition. So I want to congratulate you and I think that this is something that um, the the country is looking at in 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 the terms of an example. Um, so I just want you to honor um, the incredible work that everyone here is doing. I also want to um, share uh, for the purposes of making uh, these rules and regulations more effective as it relates to protecting the privacy of, of consumer personal information that um, that I think the agency and the board is doing an excellent job as it relates to being thoughtful with the requirements and out, outreach to industry, um, um, uh, to the public. And specifically when it comes to um, uh, some of the requirements around the cybersecurity audit, I just want to emphasize that as a consultant that has worked with consumer lenders, as an auditor that has been involved in assessing um, online lenders compliance to uh, data privacy laws and regulations, and as a consultant that has helped with readiness, helping uh, online lenders uh, bridge the, the, the gaps uh, but also being a mom to two little kids that are going to be interacting with this technology, it's important that for the cybersecurity audit items. You have 15 uh, we, seconds remaining, 15 seconds. Thank you. We be mindful that uh, the cybersecurity industry is still young and the in industry is looking at the group for some sta standardization here. And I also want to recommend prescriptive requirements for the sorry, risk assessment sorry, because that is... that, that's time. That's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rocio Baez. Okay. Um, next up, we have uh, Ronak Dailami. I'm going to allow you to unmute you and allow you to talk. You will have three minutes. Uh, go ahead and begin. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair Urban and members. Ronak Delami with Cal Chamber, representing over 14,000 members, the vast majority of which are smaller businesses. We're continuing to evaluate the drafts put forth for discussion today, but appreciate the chance to provide some initial comments that we hope would be considered prior to moving into formal rulemaking. On the whole, we are concerned that the draft rules create extensive requirements for conducting cyber audits and risk assessments that are frequently overburdensome, insufficiently risk-based, or otherwise out of sync with and exceeding other state privacy laws, potentially conflicting with generally accepted standards. <clears throat> we are especially concerned that these regulations, including the ADMT regs, at times go beyond the bounds of the CCPA itself and the directive set by that law, and in fact veer into rewriting the law, such as with the brand new opt-out for behavioral advertising and for processing the PI of consumers to train ADMT. <clears throat> Excuse me. We strongly urge the agency to avoid getting ahead of the legislature and governor, as well as the voters in such a manner, particularly in relation to AI. With respect to the cybersecurity audits uh, regulations, we are concerned that they place companies into a perpetual audit, diverting critical resources away from actually ensuring security. We note that the CCPA calls for regulations for businesses whose processing of consumers' PI presents significant risk to consumers' privacy or security. The statute sets forth that significant risk requires consideration of the size and complexity of the business and the nature and scope of processing activities. We feel that the triggers in this draft fall short of that directive. Next, the requirements for approval of uh, Approval and oversight of audits by a company's board of directors create responsibilities that are out of sync with accepted norms for board action and involvement for publicly traded companies. We see a similar issue in the risk assessment regulations, believe they should be eliminated. Turning to the risk assessment ADMT regs, as drafted, these rules create extensive compliance obligations across a broad array of processing activities, going far beyond the contours of what's commonly understood to be privacy regulation. We caution that some of the risk assessment requires, requirements, such as the requirement to disclose to the agency, can actually violate confidentiality agreements and require companies to divulge confidential and proprietary information, potentially including trade secrets. If disclosure is to be required, proper protections are needed to ensure that this information is protected from Public Records Act requests and to ensure applicable legal privileges are retained. Next, we find it alarming that the ADMT regulations are being used to create new overbroad opt-out and data deletion requirements. The CCPA notably defined opt-out choices and balance consumer rights with the operational needs of companies, and these regulations upset that critical balance. And finally, the use of ADMT in the employment context raises unique considerations. The inclusion of profiling in the ADMT definition, even when the technologies are not making significant employment decisions and requiring employers to allow- 15 employees seconds to opt, left, 15 seconds. To opt out of the use of the technology, even when the use is job related and consistent with business necessity would unduly burden employers. And with that, we thank you for your time. Thank you, Anak Delami. Ms. Ellen, how many more people do we have on the queue? We have two. Okay, thank you. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Stacey Higginbotham, I'm going to unmute you and allow you to talk. You will have three minutes. Go ahead when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you. So hi, I'm Stacey Higginbotham. I'm a policy fellow focused on cybersecurity at Consumer Reports, and I am going to be commenting on the draft of the cybersecurity audit regulations. So these sorts of compliance criteria measured by an audit are already best practices across industries. And while they can come at a cost, they also benefit businesses by helping them establish policies and procedures to prevent and retroactively deal with hacks. In its latest breach report, IBM estimates that the global average cost of a data breach this year was $4.45 million. So this is not a huge cost to a business and does provide benefits. So when we talk about the regulations, our questions are in section 7001 in the definitions. There's a definition for multi-factor authentication and the law requires at least two authentication types. I just wanna make sure that that is future proof for things like pass keys, which are coming right now and usually only require one type of authentication like a biometric or a token. So in section 7122I, there was some text about the board and executive team having to review and understand the audit, we are in favor of that because cybersecurity needs to be part of a business culture and all of its processes. And this can only happen if leadership is on board and takes responsibility. And finally, in section 7123MI, related to training, 
we wanted to offer a suggestion for improving cybersecurity overall, and that would be to tie the type of employee and contractor training to the level of privilege the employee has within the IT or physical systems. Those with greater privileges, even if they are contractors, should get more intensive security training. This also applies to executives who might have more access. Anyhow, thank you for doing this. In this, These are really great rules, and we appreciate y'all. Thank you, Stacey Hickenbotham. All right. Um, last, we have Eileen. Eileen, I'm going to sorry, I'm going to unmute you. Um, there you go. And um, go ahead. You have three minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. My name is Aileen Kiernan, and I come before you today not just as an individual, but a representative of the countless consumers who value their right to privacy and the protection of personal data. In the discourse surrounding the proposed CCPA regulations, I feel compelled to express the urgent need to uphold the core principles of the legislation and safeguard the interests of consumers. The CCPA was a milestone in recognizing the importance of granting consumers control over their personal data. It was a pivotal step towards empowering individuals in an increasingly digital age where data has become a currency of its own. As we discuss potential amendments and regulations, it is paramount to remember the original intent of the legislation to strengthen consumer control and enhance privacy. I understand the concerns raised by businesses and employers here, but I feel compelled to emphasize that it is crucial to maintain a balanced perspective. While businesses have had time to adapt, consumers have been waiting for the promise of enhanced data protection to be fully realized. Any compromise or delay in implementing stringent regulations would be a disservice to the very essence of the CCPA. We need our policymakers to stand firm against lobbying pressure, especially from the largest technology and inter internet corporations with near monopoly power over user data. These behemoth companies in particular can easily afford to disregard regula regulations and have counted on agencies being too overwhelmed to investigate violations. Strict privacy rules under the CCPA force them to respect consumer consent around data collection and sales. We must resist the temptation to cater to corporate interests at the expense of consumer rights. The proposed regulations signify progress, a step towards rectifying the power imbalance between corporations and individuals. We cannot afford to backtrack on this journey, especially in the face of powerful lobbying. The technology and internet giants with their immense influence and access to vast amounts of user data should not be exempt from stringent regulations. These regulations are our shield against potential abuse of our personal information. They force these entities to respect our consent and ensure our data is handled responsibly. I implore the board to stand firm against industry pressures seeking to dilute the regulations. Now more than ever, as technology advances, we need robust safeguards in place. Our rights as consumers should not be compromised for the convenience of a few powerful entities. Let us not forget the purpose of the CCPA to give California consumers meaningful control over their personal data. I implore you to prioritize the protection of consumer rights and privacy over the interests of those who may seek to exploit or disregard the regulations. And I urge you in the strongest terms not to weaken any draft regulations that represent real progress towards giving consumers meaningful control over our personal data, which is the intention and spirit of the CCPA leg legislation. Thank you for your time and commitment to upholding the principles of consumer protection embedded in the CCPA. Thank you, Eileen. Ms. Allen? Uh, yes, we have one person left. This is Tyler Gerlach. Uh, Tyler, I'm going to unmute you and allow you to talk. Go ahead. You have three minutes when you're ready. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Hi, my name is Tyler Gerlach, and I'm the Public Policy Associate at the California Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce, representing the interests of the over 746,000 Asian American and Pacific Islander-owned small businesses in the state. Our members understand the importance of these technologies, automated decision-making technologies deeply embedded in the day-to-day -day operations and businesses across California, contributing significantly to their efficiency and success. But rushed regulations would put California small businesses at a disadvantage as ADMT continues to evolve. The agency must actively engage, educate, and collaborate with small and diverse business owners throughout the decision-making process to understand their perspectives regarding the implications of these regulations. The agency cannot prioritize the race to be the first agency to draft ADMT regulations over being thoughtful and including the perspectives of the small business community that keep the state running. 
the governor's office and legislature should continue to lead on this issue. Governor Newsom's recent AI executive order outlines a clear process and the agency's actions should be consistent with that. We hope that the rulemaking timeline is clear and aligned with the realities of the small business community in California. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler Gerlach. Okay, um, if there are any other members of the public who would like to speak at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand or you start nine on your um, phone key. I do see several more hands. Um, okay, we are going to go to uh, Nicole Smith. I am going to allow you to talk and unmute you. You should have, uh, you should have three minutes. Uh, please begin when you're ready. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone's work with this. Um, I'm an, a privacy attorney in Silicon Valley. I work for a cybersecurity company and I've been in charge of doing audits on vendors. So any company that we bring in and share data with for about a dozen years now. And I think it's very critical that um, the agency includes this in rulemaking. Um, Regarding some of the points that were raised earlier, pursuant to GDPR requirements, many of the medium and large size companies in the Valley have been doing this for five plus years. And we currently have a lot of learnings from that. Um, my question for the board, and you can address this in any way that you'd like, is uh, in order to submit some of the learnings, is there a deadline where it would be most useful for you to hear some of the things that we've learned about? And also areas, as I believe one of the board members raised, for improvement on uh, these learnings, for instance, the ICO in the UK provided great templates, but we've learned as a tech company um, that there are loopholes where vendors could try and fool their customers, such as, you know, the entities doing business with them into sharing more data than they have adequate security for, from. So we have put in more of a trust but verify approach. And I'm more than happy to share these learnings with the board. Would love to hear, especially given the holidays, what is the ideal deadline for these in order to be helpful for the board members? All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole Smith. Okay, next you have Craig Erickson. Craig, I'm gonna allow you to talk and unmute you. You will have uh, three minutes. Um, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Craig Erickson, a California consumer, and I'll be commenting on uh, the draft uh, regulations on uh, ADMT, uh, specifically section 7030, subsection O, and 7031, subsection D, item four, which basically re uh, requires businesses to provide a link for consumers to file complaints against the business with enforcement agencies. And uh, I think that this is more likely to be abused than it would actually provide uh, actual benefits to consumers and businesses um, and enforcement agencies. Uh, in particular, I'm concerned that uh, businesses may track and possibly uh, discriminate against website users who click on the link, that uh, competitors, authorized agent services, hackers, or hacktivists will exploit the link for their own purposes, that enforcement agencies can be deluged with uh, complaints, like effectively denying service to other consumers who use these websites, or uh, obfuscating legitimate swarm complaints uh, that contain evidence by flooding the complaint system with anonymous or unsubstantiated complaints. And that uh, consumers will expect enforcement action, but won't receive notification of the enforcement action, which could contribute to apathy or mistrust that the law is uh, being fairly enforced. So therefore, I implore the board to explain its rationale for this particular requirement and why the board thinks the benefits to the public 
would outweigh any potential cost to businesses and consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Craig Erickson. Ms. Allen? Um, if there, we have no hands raised at this time. However, if there is any member of the public who'd like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand using the raise hand feature on Zoom or star nine on your phone. Again, this is uh, for agenda item two, which is to A, to B, to C, cybersecurity, risk assessments, and automated decision-making technology regulations. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, Thanks. Wait, thank you, Ms. Allen, and thank you to all the members of the public um, who have taken the time to comment today. Uh, it's much appreciated and um, lots of valuable and helpful information um, from, from the public comment um, period. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to um, propose, uh, request, I suppose, three motions. I will start with the first, which is on the cybersecurity uh, audit regu draft regulations. I would like to request a motion to direct staff to advance the proposed cybersecurity regulations to formal rulemaking up through commencement of the 45-day public comment period and to authorize staff to make additional changes where necessary to improve the text clarity, improve readability, or otherwise ensure compliance with the Administrative Procedures Act. May I have that motion? I move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Allen, could you please call the roll call vote? I can. Uh, this is a motion for uh, cybersecurity regulations number 2A, as stated by the chair. Uh, board member De La Torre. Aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye, but just because this happened to me before on boards, I do want to mention to everybody that uh, that one in 7123A, that, that last sentence, I'm not happy about. So I don't want to have people come back and say, you approved this because that's happened to me before. So I'm approving it for now, on the, uh, but I do want to raise that it's still an issue for me. Thanks. Uh, McTaggart, aye. Uh, Worth? Aye. Uh, Worth, aye. Uh, Chair Urban? Aye. And yes, Mr. McTaggart, I think everybody's on notice when it comes back to us again, um, you may say the same thing. <laughs> if it, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, um, all members of the board. Um, I now uh, request a, a motion to direct staff to incorporate um, changes and incorporate the discussion uh, from today by the board and to additionally receive feedback from board members on the draft risk assessment regulations and to propose a revised draft at a following meeting for advancement to formal rulemaking. May I have can, can I ask a question before we move on that? Logistically, how will that work? Then in January, we will see a new draft from staff that includes those. And how I will they interact with us? Do we have information on that? So in terms of the last part, um, uh, the interaction will be like other things that we have moved to staff. So, for example, the cybersecurity regulations and previous um, uh, um, initiatives where individual board members can talk to staff in one-way conversations. In terms of when the board may see it again, um, I can't predict that exactly. Um, and I don't know if Mr. F Mr. Laird wants to say for sure or if um, he wants to provide some information about about that about when the when it would return to the board yeah. um so you know um i think we could uh frame the draft so that it could come back to the board um immediately prior to the 45 day public comment period but after we've completed all supporting paperwork including development of the economic analysis and all um that would be staff's recommendation but we are happy to take direction and I think Ms. De La Torre was asking if that would necessarily be January's scheduled meeting. Right, right. So oh. there is no. feedback that has to be incorporated from this meeting. So that will be a new draft. And I was assuming like that will happen and we will be shown a draft that incorporates the feedback from this meeting. And then we will be able to comment on that. that that's what will make sense to me. So maybe January we will see the draft that incorporates this meeting. And then after that, we can comment 
on on it. I think um, staff, I, I well my motion my my motion that I requested directs staff to gather information from board members um, uh, and to incorporate changes or discussion today. Um, I um, thought of it as incorporating finding out the information that we asked for. So I wouldn't want to insist that it be January um, if. To some degree, it also depends on us um, uh, being able to um, uh, offer our thoughts to the board, to the staff. So I would like to give them some timing flexibility there. But I think, yeah. And my question is not as much to the timing as to the next draft that we see in a board meeting. Is that a draft that we're going to be asked to vote on to move to formal rulemaking? There's no in between draft. Is that the plan? That is the plan. Which of course we don't have to do. We could we could say we're not. Right. I think this is ready. So 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 the option is we either don't see a draft again until the date that we're asked to to move it in to formal rulemaking. At which point do we just go to formal rulemaking? Not necessarily, but this would give staff the ability to pull together. The eyesore, the economic analysis, do about, do all that research. So we would have it in front of us the next time we discuss it. Right, but we don't. I, have I mean, it's just that there was a lot. There was a lot of feedback, particularly to the last piece, and I want to be sure that we have an effective um, way to incorporate that in a way that's um, thoughtful, as opposed to. You know, I don't want to be in a position where we come back in March with a draft to go into formal and then and then there's a request to delay that process basically because we haven't seen how our feedback was or was not incorporated in the draft. Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, yeah I, I would just say I'd love to have a chance, you know, before all the economic analysis has been done and it's sort of like either submit it now and uh you know so if you raise up a, a concern you end up derailing a whole process here so I, I don't know maybe we could do that individually and we can have you know individual meetings along the way with the staff to get comfortable enough uh so that at least they know okay board member x is not happy with this or you know is probably not going to support or something i don't know but i do think Sometimes you get these things and they get presented in the package and you know at that point the the, the consequence of being the squeaky wheels even is is is, is huge. Right. But what I want to bring to Mrs. Serpent's attention is just the um vastly keen implications on that. Because if we are in different places, we should have that conversation at a board meeting and not individually potentially for vastly king. Um so in my in my experience, it has always been that it has to come and be publish the new draft before we have that conversation? I might run on that, Mr. Serpent. I, I don't. So once it is in the public rulemaking process, it follows the process. Prior to that, we can do whatever we would like. Um, I would like to give staff discretion um, to be able to come to us and tell us we have everything here. We have the initial statement of reasons with all the background. We've talked to all the board members um, and things are ironed out. And then the board could agree or disagree or for staff to come back and say, we've had a lot of feedback from board members. We've taken into account more information. We want to um, have you um, discuss it before we ask for the formal rulemaking. I mean, the, the, the request, like this is just so there is an option. We don't we don't have to send it to formal rulemaking. Yeah. Could, could we, um, perhaps the motion not requiring that the draft come back in January, but if possible, incentivizing? Yeah, it does not. Okay. Require, but I can, I'll restate it and I will, let me add. Yeah, stay in a preference towards it if it's feasible. I think it just will be easier to have the conversation, the five of us, as opposed to individually with the staff. Okay, let me restate the motion. Um, to try to be certain that um, it's clear that it isn't necessarily going to be um, a formal rulemaking and ask Mr. Laird if it is an appropriate motion. 
Um, may I have a motion to direct staff to incorporate any changes agreed by the board during today's discussion, consider the board's discussion overall, and additionally receive feedback on the draft risk assessment regulations from board members after this meeting, and propose a revised draft at the following meeting for possible advancement to formal rulemaking. I added possible. I move. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Um, Mr. Laird, are we good? Okay, thank yes. you. Okay, Ms. Allen, could you please conduct the vote? Yes, the motion is for uh, to, for um, to see the risk assessments uh, as stated by Chair Urban. Uh, board member De La Torre. Aye. Uh, De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Uh, Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Board member Worth. Aye. Worth, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Uh, Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have five uh, 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 ayes and no. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Um, and I realized I neglected to say with regards to the cybersecurity regulations motion, the motion carried with a vote of five to zero. Um, and with regards to the draft risk assessment regulations, the motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Lastly, I would request a motion to direct staff to incorporate any changes agreed to by the board during today, today's discussion and, um, and consider uh, the board's discussion overall in today's meeting and to additionally receive feedback on the draft automated decision-making regulations from board members after this meeting and to propose a revised draft at a following meeting again, for possible advancement to rulemaking. And I will, that's the end of the motion. I will editorialize here to say like, I don't think any of us expect that it will be there again. It's just a matter of options. I move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. Allen, would you please conduct the roll call vote? Um, yes, the motion is, um is regarding to be uh, the automated decision-making uh, regulations as stated by the chair, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Uh, board member Worth. Aye. Worth, aye. And Chair Urban. Aye. Uh, Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have five ayes and no notes. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Allen, and thank you to the board. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Um, I know we are all um, in need of lunch. Um, I would just like to thank, again, the subcommittee and the staff and the board for such a thoughtful, robust discussion and the public for all of their um, helpful input during public comment. I look forward to the continued discussion um, of these important um, draft regulations. Um, with that, um, I am going to announce lunch. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to take out of order on our agenda today, agenda item number 10, which is a closed session. And I hope board members are okay kind of eating lunch in the closed session. The closed session um, pursuant to government code section 11126E1 and 2A, um, uh, will, the board will now meet in the closed session to confer and receive advice from legal counsel regarding uh, two matters. Um, one is California Chamber of Commerce versus California Privacy Protection Agency et al. The other is California Privacy Protection Agency et al. versus the Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Sacramento and California Chamber of Commerce. The board will additionally meet in closed session to discuss the executive director's annual review under authority of government code section 11126A1. Um, and I would just like to say that, of course, we can't predict exactly um, how long um, the board will uh, retire to closed session. Um, I, um, we won't come back before 2.15 p.m. So folks who are um, in the public uh, meeting can know that um, uh, they are uh, uh, fine um, leaving until 2.15 p.m. After that, we will return when we are done. 
Um, and I will ask, and this is, excuse me, this public um, session will remain open, um, I think with a sign to let everyone know that we're still away. And for the board members, I would like to please invite you um, to leave this session and join the closed session um, Zoom link for us to begin our discussion. And we can talk about timing and lunch um, uh, in that session. Thank you all very much. Um, and this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is going into closed session. Thank you.